This video is going to be on eight figure operations. So a little bit of a boring topic. A lot of people know us as sales trainers, people who build sales teams, but through scaling multiple eight figure company, one of the things I really have to figure out is really how to run the day to day operations of a big business. We have over 100 plus employees. So this training is going to be on how we run our finance team, operations team, marketing team, even sales team and fulfillment team. We'll touch on a little bit. I have separate trainings for those. And you'll really see how everything integrates together. On top of that, I really cover my journey going to eight figures and beyond and essentially what hires I made and at what points. And I think that'll be really valuable for you if you're scaling your business. So enjoy. All right, All right man. Let's get going. Cool. Cool. Thank you, guys. So a uh, couple things with this presentation. Number one, I did a dry run yesterday and it was two hours. So we're not going to be able to get it all done in this session. So we'll probably do a little bit of carryover during my Q&A tomorrow. And then number two, there's a lot of information here. Really what I'm going to be doing is sharing just the day-to-day -day operations of how our eight-figure company runs. So really, we've already, like my last presentation in Nashville was um, the CSM team and how we run the fulfillment department. Obviously, most of you guys have already been through the sales team training, how we run the setters, how we run the closers. One of the things when people come into boardroom that I found, especially doing some, some calls and on the group calls, is that uh, y'all need help with the finance department and how to set up proper tracking with that, the marketing department, and also operations and how to have good cadences. So we're gonna talk about that and um, we're gonna, it, it is pretty dense. So we're gonna go through basically section by section and then if you guys have any questions, write them down and we're gonna do some intermittent Q&A, okay? Otherwise it's gonna be, your, your eyes are gonna glaze over, it's gonna be a lot, okay? So, so as I go through this, start thinking about some Q&A. Um, first, there's like a really bad screeching by the way, if you could fix that. Um, okay, so first of all, we're gonna talk about our hiring sequence to get to a million a month. So I'm gonna go through all the hires we made from zero to basic, not necessarily where we are now, but about a million a month, million five a month. And then I'm gonna tell you guys how I would do it over if I was you guys, okay? So I think that'll be really, really valuable for a lot of you guys. Then we're gonna go into the meeting sequences as you scale. So it's funny, like when you're, t when you're minus 10 employees, the amount of meetings you need to have and how you structure them is different from when you're about 20 to 30. And then when you're 30 plus, you're gonna run a professional structure, which is more what we do, and I'll show you what that is. Then we're gonna go into finance department, marketing, operations, executive team, and then the other types of meetings, offsites, all of that stuff that we do so you guys can see. Cool. Um, first of all, here's our hiring sequence. So if you guys don't know my story, I left traffic, traffic and funnels in 2019, took a few months off, and then I launched a one-on-one -on -one coaching offer just coaching sales. It was just coaching either salespeople or entrepreneurs wanted to get better at sales. Did about 70 grand, and then in January did a launch, uh, did all the closing over chat out of a Facebook group, and did 271,000. And I had so much, you know, so many clients coming in from that. My very first hire was David Davidson. So at the time, he was our first kind of CSM, but I didn't have the CSM model back then. I didn't even know what that was. So he was just kind of part-time helping out, doing some sales coaching, all of that stuff. Around then as well, I hired uh, Sasha, who's also here, and was doing uh, bookkeeping. And then also we did a, I hired an EA at a similar revenue level, about 50K a month, two months later. Okay, so this EA is a really key hire when you get started. Somebody to do all your uh, onboarding, admin, organization, getting all the clients, the things that they need, all the operational activities that didn't have to do with either the marketing, the selling, or the fulfillment. Okay, and this was a full-time person who was a player. So we did 271 in January, all off chat closing. And then we probably were about at, I would say by the summer of 2020, so this is during COVID, about 80 to 100 grand a month, maybe 150 grand a month. And that's when I pivoted everything to start doing recruiting. So that's actually when I launched the Sales Team Accelerator. Before that, it was called the Seven Figure Selling Academy. So if you guys were around for the Seven Figure Selling Academy, you're OGs, because that was a long time ago. But uh, then we hired Savannah. So funny story, we started doing the recruiting. Me and Dave did it for about three days. And I was like, we're not gonna do this. This is awful. So we found Savannah, we brought Savannah in, that was about 100 to 200 grand a month. And at this point, Savannah's doing the recruiting, Dave's helping with fulfillment, I'm still doing a ton of fulfillment, I'm doing all of the marketing, all of the copywriting, all the Facebook group posts, I'm running the ads myself, and then uh, I'm also doing all the sales calls. So it was a lot, right? And this was, I was, you know, this was a limited time to where I was, I was getting pretty burned out here. Um, then, through the summer, we probably were at about 100, 150 to 200 grand a month. 
And the big, big thing we were struggling with is I didn't know, especially because our clients are you guys. Like they're not just people doing, or beginners. You know, they're people doing 100 grand a month, 200 grand a month. I mean, we had clients doing a couple million a month, even all the way back then, because they were doing sales recruiting. So I didn't really know how to get myself out of the fulfillment, right? So I was doing all of the one-on-one -on -one calls. So around this time, we hired Mitchell, who I think Mitchell's late, but you guys know Mitchell. And I hired him to do the sales and the fulfillment. So you guys might not know this, but I had a client, he had an agency, and he was doing two and a half million a month, and he was basically having his salespeople do all the selling and all the fulfillment. So I was like, I'm gonna give that a shot. So I basically made Mitchell do that, all the selling, all the fulfillment, which allowed me to get out of that, and from there, like 30 days, we went from about 150 grand a month to like 400 grand a month, and I like lost my mind. Like that was the most burned out, like stressed I've ever been in my entire life. And so, when we did that, obviously, as you could probably imagine, Mitchell's taking all of the sales calls and like he's starting to get more and more and more and more and more accounts. So once he gets up to like 50 accounts, I'm like, dude, you're not gonna have time to take all these sales calls, right? And so the model kind of broke. And then what we had to do is I basically, at that point, created the CSM model that I teach you guys today, right? That we went over in Nashville, if you guys remember that. Okay, so the big lesson here is all summer in 2020, I was really trying to figure out how do we scale this business offer? Like, how do we scale this thing? And I didn't know how to get myself out of the one-on-ones. It was like, oh, we can't really do like group coaching. Like they're high-level business owners. They don't wanna do group coaching. And eventually I just went with something, tried it with Mitchell, didn't work. But once it was broken, I was like within seven days, I had this, cause I had to figure it out. It was like so abundantly clear what we needed to do. So we came up with the CSM account manager model, and that's when we hired Igor, your man. So uh, once we were here, the nice thing was, is especially for SDA, we were finally at a point where Mitchell was doing all the sales calls, we had two account managers, I was doing all the marketing, I was still helping with fulfillment a little bit, still helping with sales a little bit, we had Savannah doing all the recruiting, we hired another guy named Jacob, and basically we got to the point where I was like, damn, we can actually scale this thing to a million a month. Because before that, I was like, ah, oh, you know, it's, it's done for you. It's, it's too complex. You know, the TAM, it was just all these excuses. And once we had this, I was like, man, we could really scale this as like high as we want to. So we can definitely hit a million a month. And so that's when, this was sort of the, uh, the, the first point where we started to explode, okay? And so around this time as well, so about January 2021, we were at probably, I think, 500, 600 grand a month with SDA. And what was funny is in the summer before that, because I didn't think SDA was gonna scale, I spent two months writing the entire RCA promotion that ended up doing, uh, I don't know, 15, 20 million dollars, right? Like, you know, the, the typical VSL, I taught it to you guys two events ago. So I created that in the summer, turned it on. I was like, I'm not taking all these biz off calls. This is awful. So we went back to scaling uh, SDA. But I had this like dormant funnel that was just crushing. And so that's when I found Brian. And I was like, Brian, I got this dormant funnel. You should take this over and just like, I don't have time, but like, just, just go figure it out. And so that was when we started RCA and then RCA started to scale. So he started doing that. And then I would say in March, of, or no, sorry, before that, we hired a media buyer. Um, I was running all the media at that time, which especially, I still am involved in the media, but here's what I'll say is that you definitely eventually need somebody to at least push the buttons. And in hindsight, what I would have done at this point is I probably would have hired an agency like Aaron Parkinson's team or somebody else who could just take it all over. But at the time I hired basically like a freelancer kind of media buyer type of guy. So we got that off of my plate. Then we hired our first SDA closer. So Mitchell finally moved into GM. So we had Mitchell at GM, Brian at GM. And then in March of 2021, we hit a million a month for the first time, okay? And what's really, really key here, and we'll walk through the, I think I broke it down into five phases in just a second. But at this point, we didn't need to do anything new, okay? What's going on there? Didn't need to do anything new. We just needed to do more, okay? So we need to hire more salespeople, more operations people, more fulfillment coaches, more finance people, because at this point we had moved Sasha to kind of like uh, part-time, full-time controller. So she couldn't do all the receivables and all that stuff herself. So we just need to do more, not new, okay? And this is a big thing I see people, especially at the 200 grand a month mark, 600 grand a month mark, really get stuck, is just a lack of focus and trying to do new stuff, not more. Trying to fix problems with marketing opposed to problems with people. 
Does that make sense? Cool. Um, so since then, really up until today, the only new hires that we made is we got an internal recruiter. So Savannah will probably talk about that to, uh, to you guys tomorrow. I think you're probably good on that until you have 50 plus people. But I know for us, this was like a game changer. Like the, the amount of people we hired, having an actual bench that we could tap from. Like everybody talks about, oh, you got to build your recruiting bench. You got to build your recruiting pipeline. I was like, I don't know how you're going to do that. I mean, it, it's so many freaking interviews. If you put somebody on full time, tremendously easier. Uh, we were started to do so many events. We hired an events coordinator. Uh, we hired a content team, especially to run our IG shout outs. And then we hired a copywriter, not to do the main copywriting, like the VSLs and all that stuff, but to do emails, to do Facebook group posts, uh, to do IG posts, stuff like that that had a short self, uh, shelf life. I still did the ads. I still did the VSLs. Cool. So uh, I got an org chart here. I don't know if it's going to. I think it's going to be a little bit hard to do it on this screen. But I'm going to give you the as this Google Doc, and you can check that, out, check that out later of how we're actually structured now. But here's how I would do it if I was you guys. And this is what I would do if it was a VSL funnel, OK? Because the hiring sequence that you're going to have to do actually depends on your acquisition system, OK? So first hire is going to be EA or CSM, right? For me, it was David Davidson. And then my second hire was an EA. But your first and second hires, I would personally focus, and obviously you guys are all past this point, but just you know, to recap, uh, I would focus on the marketing, the selling, and a good bit of the fulfillment. And then if the first thing getting off my plate would be the fulfillment and also all the operational activities. Then I'd hire a bookkeeper so you can make sure you're making money. Okay? Then you're going to do fulfillment again if needed and or a tech contractor. I actually skipped over, but one of our first hires as well was Edward who at the time was just, like a lot of you guys work with Edward now, he has an outsourced CTO offer. At the time, he created that in my program. So we were one of his first clients, and then he's built his, his uh, you know, company kind of through us. And then, so as soon as I had essentially either one or two coaches, bookkeeper, tech, operations, then I would hire the two salespeople, which is a lot of times when you guys come to us. Okay, now this is provided you guys have an optimal selling system. So if you guys read Ready, Fire, Aim by Mark Ford, that's stage, or stage one, he talks about defining the optimal selling system. Okay, it's two things, and we're gonna talk about this later, but it's basically scalable lead gen, and then it's also a scalable, predictable, repeatable way to turn the sales calls, to turn the leads into clients. Very simple, but it's something in which you can pull the lever and get clients coming in. So in our industry, 98% of people, it's always ads. It's always some type of funnel. But I mean, you could do outbound. If you got a huge content base, you could do content. But you need something that's scalable and consistent. Okay. So as soon as you have that, you kind of have a conveyor belt going. You take you out, and then you put the two salespeople in. Then I would hire additional fulfillment ops if needed. And then also here, with setters, I t especially if you're running a VSL funnel, I typically recommend getting the two salespeople going and then hiring two setters, or getting up to four salespeople if your profitability is good, and then working up to four setters. So I would either do it at two or four to when you introduce setters. Does that make sense? So then hire seven would be a marketing integrator or a really good agency. So again, if I had to do all over again, I think eventually at our level right now, we have so many demands on our marketing at two and a half million a month, I, we have to have it in-house. But I think up and coming, it would have been much easier to do an agency. So at this stage, Basically, your responsibilities are as follows, right? You have the optimal selling system in place. You got the sales team in place. So really, this is, and we're going to talk about this, this is when you're stepping in to being a leader and being a manager. So your main responsibilities are leading the marketing team, leading the sales team, which is two people, leading the fulfillment team, which is two people, and you're going to run the two meetings a day structure that we're going to talk about in a second as well. Hires eight and nine, ten, or, uh, two more salespeople, so that gets you up to four salespeople. If your offer's at 10K and you have a back end with four salespeople, you can hit a million a month. So when I was at Traffic and Funnels, we had two salespeople, actually, a back end, and we were doing over a million a month. But I, typically four, if they're doing 25 units a piece at 10K, right there is a million a month. If they're doing 20 units, you have a little bit on the back end, you're doing a million a month. Does it make sense? So, and then at this point, you're also going on to kind of identify your sales lead and who's eventually the person you're going to groom into being a manager, okay? Then hire 10, probably another fulfillment person, and then hires 11 through 14. Uh, four setters. So to recap, at that point, you'd have four setters, four closers, two to four CSMs, two to three ops slash finance people, one tech contractor, and probably an agency. Okay? And again, if you have an offer above 7K, right at this point, and you have a back end, and your closers are closing about 25% at that price point, 
easy a million a month is just, that, just a team like that. So I would say this is like the most efficient way to get to eight figures. Does that make sense? Cool. Oh, at a million a month? Uh, probably 200 grand a month. Yeah, we were, we were super profitable on ads for a while. Uh, and then remember, at this point, you know, a million a month plus, all your hires depend on your constraints, right? So the hires you should make, and even up until this point, the hires you should make are based on you either buying back your time or alleviating bottlenecks from your team and buying back their time, okay? So you should always think, what is my current constraint? And that is gonna tell you who you need to hire next. So future hires you consider from there, moving somebody into sales manager, moving somebody into a CFO, HR, COO type position. So we have two people. In those roles, we split between Savannah and Sasha, which is kind of unique, but it works for us. Uh, moving somebody into client success director, bringing marketing in-house or keeping your agency, uh, hiring a copywriter like we have for emails, SMS, social media. We, have a, we do a tremendous amount of money for emails. So if you guys aren't sending a daily email, to your list, just drive an application every single time, leaving a lot of money on the table. Sometimes we send two emails a day, too. Social content team, internal, rec internal recruiter, events coordinator. The only difference, some of you guys run a group. If you're running a group, I would hire the setters first, and then I would hire the two closers. So two setters first, then two closers, and then go two setters, two closers again. Because the group can't work, you don't get the appointments without the setters. So that's the only difference if you're, hiring, if you're doing a group. So all that makes sense so far. Good? So we're going to cover, let me go through this and we'll do a few questions. We're going to cover the phases to eight figures and beyond. And this is something that I think a lot of you guys are getting a lot of value out of. So phase one, nobody in the room is in phase one here. Phase one's figuring out who the hell you are, OK? What am I selling? Who am I selling it to? How am I selling it? Why is my product and service unique? And um, also just like validating your offer, you know, just actually selling something consistently. So the primary energy that you're utilizing in this stage is an innovative energy. So a lot of creativity. You have to find new stuff, all right? Phase two, and we covered this, is defining your optimal selling system, right? So this is really what's gonna get you to about one to three million a year, all right? So this is essentially getting an acquisition system in place to where when you add more inputs, you get more outputs, right? You can spend more on ads, and you can get more sales calls. You can hire more outbound SDRs, and you can get more sales calls. Does that make sense? So you need a scalable acquisition system. That's, that's really the only way you're gonna be able to, not the only way, but it's, it's the primary way in which you're gonna be able to build a sales team on the back of that, okay? So it's those two criteria, and of course, you need a re repeatable, predictable way to convert those into calls that doesn't all rely on you, right? That doesn't have founder syndrome, like I'm the only person who can sell my thing. You have to have a repeatable diagnostic and prescription process. Okay, a lot of you guys have that as well. So here, still, the primary energy that we're using in this phase is an innovative energy. So we're still having to create and make something new, right? So if you're a great marketer, like this is still, like this is, this is a breeze for you, right? Operators, not so much. Now phase three is building the team. Now this is where people start to struggle, okay? So now in phase three, and I, you know, the, these revenue ranges are a little bit rough, okay, but it kind of gets you to the point. It's 150K a month to 500 grand a month. This is building the team. So this is where, now that we have the optimal selling system defined, essentially, we're looking at more, not new. Okay, we need more closures, more setters, more CSMs, more ops finance, and more ad spend. But we don't need to do anything new, okay? And then the other thing is that you have to fully step into being a leader and a manager. So the biggest mistake that a lot of people make to getting to five to 10 million a year by far is they're creative people or they're marketers or they're great writers and they do not transition to being a great manager. It's not, it's an, and it's, a lot of times it's an identity thing for them. It's not them. So either you need to make that transition. I had to make that transition. I was a sales guy, okay? So I had to make that transition or what you need to do is you need to find a, a really great integrator, right? So that's why a lot of you know, business partners, you, you guys have heard, you have the visionary, the integrator, okay? You have kind of the innovation energy type person, and then you have the operational type person, okay? I just kind of had to transition. So once we got our system in place, like we were just basically running that call funnel off of ads, you guys know what it is, okay? At that point, we were like a one-trick pony. That was 
all we were doing, and I was, full, I was managing the sales team, fulfillment team, I was you know, helping with the setters, uh, helping manage ops and finance, and I was managing all the marketing. Right? It was like I was just the manager, essentially. So this transition is really big. What happens here is instead of stepping into being the manager, a lot of people get to the point where they're doing two, three million a year, and instead of trying to fix their constraints through people, they try to fix their constraints through marketing. Okay? So you ever see the people who it's like they're just doing new offers constantly? They're doing new promotions? So it's like when, when Charlie Munger says, when everything looks, uh, when all you have is hammers, everything looks like a nail. So all, their, their skill set is marketing. They're just trying to fix all their scalability issues with marketing. Okay? So they either need to find a partner or embrace temporarily stepping into being a leader and just a full time manager. Right? So that's what I, that's what I told. Uh, Often, right there, he knows. Um, so, the, uh, and the other thing, you know, if you're somebody like me, this is also a time where your creative juices are not really fulfilled. It's kind of monotonous. You're just training people. Okay. So, primary energy here is a producer and a unifier type of energy. So, if you guys have read um, the, the title of the book, is uh, it's. I forget what the title of the book is. It'll come to me. But essentially, there's four main primary energies in business. There's innovative energy. That's like the creative energy. There's producers. Producers ask what and how to execute. It's like, what needs done? I'm going to get it done. That's like your sales manager. Okay. Then there's a unifying energy, which is like uniting people, getting people to work in unison. That's like your culture per person. Think like HR. And then you have your stabilizing energy. Okay. That's like your finance person. Okay, or like your operational staff, your COO. Okay, so when you get to phase three, it's a shift in energy. You have to go to producing and unifying because you don't really need to create anything new. So for us, when we went from about, um, you know, like I would say, we were about 500 grand a month, but still 500 grand a month to 2 million, 2 million a month, 2.5 million a month, we just went, we ran literally one ad to one VSL to a couple salespeople. I mean, that was it. And I was just totally just all in on training those salespeople and building up leaders. So phase four is building up leaders. So I think if you're the full-time manager, you can get to probably about five million a year, okay? At a certain point, what you're gonna need to do is build up leaders underneath you so you can start buying back your time. So a lot of you guys are either phase three probably or phase four. So here, buy back your time. And what's key is, again, somebody on your team has to be a great integrator. Like You either have to have the primary integrator who's your partner, or you got to learn these skills, because somebody's going to need to transfer the skills of management to somebody else. Same way you should learn how to sell your offer before you build your sales team, because you're transferring the skill of selling to somebody else. It's the same thing with management and leadership. All right, so now you're really pouring in. Like you might have that really standout salesperson and you're managing the sales team yourself. You gotta start pouring into that person and building them up so they can take the sales team management off your plate. Same thing with maybe marketing. Same thing definitely with ops finance. Fulfillment, also same thing, okay? So here, it's totally like Jesus take the wheel. You know, you, you're gonna feel like, man, I'm just really letting go of control here. It's like. Cross your like, like you know, an example is like this event. I had zero to do with the planning, so I'm just like, you know, I'm, hope it goes well, right? Uh, which is going well so far. So positions to build into is you need to build people into a COO, HR, CFO function, which is one to two hires. Okay, so your COO is kind of like your operator. They're going to run your ops team, maybe your finance team. Uh, and even, you know, it, it depends on the definition. There's so many different ways to do this. Your HR person is going to be doing payroll, do, going to be doing employee contracts, doing, doing the W-2s, international payroll, all of that stuff. And then your CFO, we're going to talk about those responsibilities in a second, but that does your books, uh, your P&L, your, your financial projections, all that stuff. Okay? We have that split. Like, we kind of conglomerated those uh, opportunities and split them between Savannah and Sasha. Then you're going to have your sales management. You need to groom somebody into that. And then probably, uh, potentially the easiest one is grooming somebody in the client success director, okay, and building up that person. And with all of these, you want it's not a uh, light switch. It's a volume knob, okay? You do not just one day say, you know what? You're the sales manager. Good luck, right? You, you, you got to, like, 
you got to transition them into it, okay? So it's like, at first, let's say uh, Brian and Mitchell, they would take one meeting for me a week. And then it was two meetings a week. And then they took all the one-on-ones. So I wasn't doing any of the one-on-ones with the salespeople. And then it got to the point where I was doing two meetings a week, and then they were doing three meetings a week. Then it got to the point where I was doing two meetings, but I really wasn't doing projections or the leading part. I was just back there for training. And now it's like sometimes when I join the meetings, I feel like I'm just kind of like messing it up. It's like I just got to let them kind of do their thing. you know. So it's, it's a volume knob, not a light switch. Same goes for your CSD. right? I, I would phase them out of uh, accounts, for instance, and I'd phase them into more and more responsibilities as the team grows. The only one you have to watch out here is with your sales manager, I do not recommend doing a player coach. You know, if you read books on sales management, there's uh, you know, Mike Weinberg's book, he talks about the fallacy of the player coach. The issue with sales managers is, well, player coaches, is that you're combining a selfless and selfless activity. Okay? Sales managers are like your full-time head coach. So they're pouring in to all of your salespeople. They're reviewing all of the calls. They're like, you know, bringing them back up and, and dusting them off when they fall down, all of that stuff. Your, your salesperson is somebody who's got tunnel vision and it's all about the next deal. And if you try to combine those, we, we read all the literature, everything said not to do this. We tried it and it was a miserable failure. And it's not, the, it's not the, the sales lead's fault, the player coaches. It's that we're asking somebody to do things with entirely two different energies. And with sales, with fulfillment, it's a little bit different because there's a finite amount of stuff you can do. With fulfillment, there's only so much you can do. With sales, you can always make another call. You can always take another call. You can always hit pipeline for 30 more minutes. So with, with sales lead, it's very, very, very tough. We tried to do it uh, against pretty much all the advice I'd ever gotten, and it was a huge failure. So we got rid of that. So with your sales manager, the way, what I do recommend doing is you find your best person. You do make them into a sales lead, but you're going to throw them like 1000 2000 bucks a month, and you're going to tell them it's like the tryout to eventually be sales manager. Okay? And then in doing this, you're going to get, you know, if you, if you miss a meeting, they can take over a meeting. You're still going to do all the one-on-ones, but maybe give them like 10 call reviews a week that they can do give them a few other responsibilities they can do, have them do some call reviews and you watch how they're doing it. You want to like slowly phase that person in, but then once you want them to be manager, you just flip the switch, they're the manager, okay? Now you still, still might run the meetings. I, I just said, you know, it's not a light switch, it's volume not. You might still run the meetings, but they're going to be doing the primary amount of coaching, all the one-on-ones, all the call reviews, and then they can finally start taking over the meetings, okay? That's the, that's the slowest thing I would give away is that daily sales meeting, because that daily sales meeting will 100% define your culture. Okay, so slowly giving that away will prevent you from going away for a couple of months and then going back and, and attending a sales meeting and being like, who are these people? Like, why do they act this way? All right? I'm telling you, I mean, a lot of people join, they're like, I think there's a problem with my marketing. And then we're like, well, let, me, let us see a sales meeting. And we're like, they're like, I'm not do, we're, we're not doing sales meetings anymore. It's like, oh, okay, well, might not be the marketing. So, um, phase four. Oh, we just did phase four. So, a good thing here, if you guys have read uh, Built to Last, you know, they talk about the value of these companies who've transcended uh, hundreds of years. The value in essentially um, grooming leaders internally. They hire middle management direct, but in terms of like the CEO of who's taken over the company, they're always groomed. At least that's what they found have been the best companies. So what I've also found, and this is not just from my experience, this is also just from watching all of you guys and seeing what's worked and what's not worked. A lot of times, hiring somebody into sales management or CSD is very low success rate. Now, COO, HR, CFO could be a little bit different. You know, if it's somebody who's running payroll, doing the contracts, running finances, that can you know, that's kind of the same across a lot of different types of businesses. But sales and CSD is very specific to our industry. It takes a high amount of industry acumen and a high amount of um, specialized knowledge. Okay, so I recommend grooming those ones, potentially HR, CFO you can bring in. I'm not saying you couldn't find a sales manager to come in and just like take it over from day one. I'm just saying pretty low success rate from what I have seen. Okay, so um, another thing in phase four, is mission, vision, and values becomes really, really important. So I, you know, I'll, I'll be honest, when I was at like 100 to 300 grand a month, 
I was like, this mission, vision, and values thing, yeah, I was like, it's kind of a scam, doesn't make sense, <laughs> I'm, I'm good, right? And then I read uh, Organizational Physics. That was the book I couldn't remember a second ago. And that book really opened my eyes to how important mission, vision, and values are. So here's a way to think about it. As you scale more, okay, there's just, it, it takes a higher degree of energy just to maintain what you're already doing. You know, back in the day to maintain 200 grand a month, it was like, I mean, that was like almost like passive income. Like that, to me, that was like easy. Now to just maintain two and a half million a month, I'm like killing myself. You know, not literally, but it's, it's much harder comparatively, right? So just to maintain, it takes such a higher degree of energy, right? And that's because you have to fight entropy. So entropy is the natural energy uh, of everything going into this disarray or going into disorder. The bigger systems get, the more entropy there is. So the more energy that has to go in just to fight the entropy and just to keep doing what you're doing. So mission and vision and values is how you actually combat that phenomena as it happens. Here's the easiest way to think about it, and I got this from organizational physics. I think about like the 17th century boat that's sailing across the ocean, okay? So the company is the boat. Like we're all getting on the boat together. The vision is where we're going. And preferably, it's the exciting destination or challenging destination of where we're going. The mission is why we're going where we're going. And the values is how we're going to interact or what is the minimal, tolerable, acceptable amount of behavior on the journey of going where we're going. Does that make sense? Okay. So when you, like I always have that analogy and when we're hiring people, it's like, is this the right person to get on the boat? Right? Is this, are, are they excited about where we're going? Do they like where we're going? Are they excited by the why? Does that fill them up? And are they gonna be able to interact with each other on the journey to where we're going? Here's the thing, is that when you get a big company, when you have five, 10, 20 people, it's not that hard. When you have 100, like we're right below 100. When you have 100, to keep the boat analogy, you got people rowing this way, somebody's rowing backwards, somebody's supposed to be rowing, they're sleeping, it's just a mess. So the mission and vision and values is, is metaphorically how you get everybody rowing in synchronicity in the right direction. Does that make sense? So this is truly why this is so important. And it, it, I will say, 100, 200, 300 a month, nah. You know, at, at, at eight figures, for sure. So you might as well get this down now. It's gonna make a huge difference, okay? So also, phase four, margins suffer. So the thing you do gotta create is back end, you gotta raise your prices if you can, hire appointment setters if you can, and then new creatives to bring ads costs back down. Okay? At this phase, you do kind of have to go through a phase where you're trying to get more out of what you already got, but you're not going to be launching new offers, new funnels. That's not going to happen. You just need to kind of get more out of what you already got. So primary energy here, producing and unifying. All right, we already talked about that. Phase five is re-innovate and repeat. Okay? This is the stage I'm in now. So here, up until this point, we've been a one-trick pony. Okay? One funnel, one sales process, one fulfillment. Right? It's like, we're good at one thing, that's it. You know, we scaled RCA to two million a month, uh, literally off one ad. You guys probably saw it, it was like all these online gurus have a bass, ass backwards, one ad. You know, that's all we were doing. And, and off one channel, too. But what happens is, is I don't, you know, it, it is still hard to explain. When we hit two and a half million a month, it was like an invisible ceiling. Like, no matter what we did, we could not freaking break, break this plateau. We maybe get to 2.6, and we go back down to 2.3. Then we get to 2.5, then 2.2, then 2.6, then 2.2. It was just so, and, and so we've been stuck there since, I believe, November of last year. And uh, this has been really frustrating, because you know, up until this point, we went from 100K a month to 2.5 million a month, and like, a, that little like, 100K to 2.5 million was like a 12-month span. So, you know, we're thinking we're awesome, like we're the best. Any, like, I'm like, everything I do and I touch is gold. I'm, it's, it's great. And then like, this was really humbling. Like this was really difficult because you're just so used to adding a couple hundred grand to your, to your monthly revenue every single month, okay? So like what would happen to us, and I put it here, is we would sell more units, but do the same cash collected. So we were selling more people and making the same amount of money. It's like, well, we're just making it harder on ourselves. So we, like our cash per unit would go down. That was because of refunds, missed payments, uh, expenses. So we would sell more people too, but then our NOI would go down and we make the same amount of profit. Right? So again, it's like, wow, we went from, like with RCA, we went from 200 clients a month to 350 clients a month and made no more money. Like think about how frustrating that is because we've got to deal with an extra 150 people a month. 
It's like, why did we even do that? Right? So um, here, you know, your, your marketing channels are pretty much reaching the brim. So a lot of people think they're, they're hitting their TAM too early. You know, if, if you're at this level, there is such a thing as TAM, right? Like, there is such a thing as you're, you know, if you're doing eight figures, you might be running out of, like, you've exhausted the angle that you're at, you've exhausted the market that you're at, or at least the channel that you're on. The other thing, too, is word of mouth is really important here, right? Like, Hormozy calls this the invisible hand. And uh, what I have found is that, like, if you have positive word of mouth, it's, it's going to give you a little bit more grace, right? It's going to be a little bit more momentum. It's like you got tailwinds. Negative word of mouth, you got headwinds. It's going to crush you, okay? So this is where, really, you, you could have scaled with kind of a subpar product in the high seven figures. To go to eight figures, to multiple eight figures, you, 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 you can't do that. Like, your product has got to be really good, especially because people who are not going to get results, now you seem like this big you know, corporation who they're just going to take down, okay? So a lot of learning lessons for us there, too. So here, what we finally have to do, and this was my realization uh, the past quarter, is you have to re-innovate on your marketing side. So do you see how this came full circle, right? We were the marketer who didn't want to be a leader. We finally stepped into being a leader. We, we, we uh, were full-time manager. We built up our managers. Then we bought our time back. And now I got to go back into marketing. So now everything and anything I do, like the company's really run by Mitchell, Savannah, Sasha, and Brian. I, right now, am only working on the strategy and the copywriting. Right? So it's exactly what I did when I started. So it kind of comes full circle. It's pretty cool. But here, now we've got to think about, you know, are we going to upgrade the campaign? Are we going to launch a new angle uh, to the existing, uh, or sorry, launch a new angle to a new cycle or demographic? Are we going to go down market? Are we going to go up market? Are we going to go adjacent market? Are we going to do front-end products? Are we going to do more back-end products? Are we going to do cross-sells? We start to have to be more prolific with our marketing at this stage. Okay, so I was a little bit too stubborn because I had heard all coming up, you know, complexity is the enemy of scale, right? You want to focus. And uh, I was on a call with another guy who's doing uh, like 20, 20 million a year. You guys would all know who he is. And I was telling him this. I was like, man, like I'm just so, fr like, I, you know, we just can't scale our one thing. And he was like, dude, like you're trying to hit 50 million a year. Like the complexity is inevitable. And then so when I started to embrace the potential of complexity, that's when I realized, OK, we have to start being prolific with our marketing. You know, so long term, we plan on doing a lot more content, doing a podcast, doing YouTube, uh, having more front end events, like you know, $200 and upselling them into certain things, and then also uh, having more low ticket and, and, and mid ticket products. You know? I do not recommend that until you get to a point where you've just maxed out your one trick pony. And then phase six, you know, I'm purely speculating at this point because I am nowhere near this. But, uh, you know, I, I, what I, from what I've seen, you become a portfolio of companies. So multiple offers, multiple CEOs, multiple brands, or you really narrow in, 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 whether that's because you went down market or what have you, you narrow in on a brand that you can scale to 100 million plus. You know, one of my best friends is doing 12 million a month right now off of one offer. So, you know, you either got, but I, I'll be honest, like, with SDA, you know, with, with done for you recruiting, are we going to do 12 million a month? I don't know. It's pretty tough, right? So part of that is the opportunity as well. So it might be getting into a, another opportunity. It might be building a portfolio of companies. But you know, I'm just speculating at that point. So if that's somebody else. So anybody have? Let's take a little little pause there. Who has questions on what we just covered? Uh, got two. I'll start with one. So what do you recommend if you currently have? Well, like, so what I would do is I would pay one to two thousand a month, and then I would I would give them like again like, hey, you're gonna do ten call reviews a week and send it to all the reps. You're gonna do this amount of QC to make sure they're doing doing what they're supposed to be doing. You're gonna take the sales meetings when I'm gone. Uh, you may do a few one on ones here and there, but just expect that they're gonna totally prioritize their projections and not coaching. And, and, and for no other reason that to them, how can they be a leader if they're not hitting their own projections and leading by example? So you see how it, it, it's really tough. It's not because they're bad people. You're just not going to get the coach out of them that you would get if they're full time. So that's what I would recommend when you're in that intermedi inter, uh, like intermediary phase. Now, once you're, if you got you know, minimum four to six reps and you feel like you got the right person, what I would do is start phasing them in, just taking them off calls, and like they're just the full-time, all-out coach. Okay? 
and I would keep the meetings and I'd slowly phase out the meetings. The meetings is like your guardrails to make sure the team doesn't go off the rails because there's the, uh, you know, the new sales management going on. So the meetings are kind of the guardrails, but then you can have that player coach come in, or not player coach, the, the sales manager, and you guys are kind of tag teaming it. You're leading the team, but he's coaching and training the team. And you're just doing that one call a day. Then you can slowly phase it down once there's that trust built. And, and again, like, if you're like, well, shit, he's my best salesperson too. I don't, what if I move him to the manager and I'm scared that I'm gonna lose all his revenue? Like, well, what if you don't move him in and he remains to be your best salesperson and all your other people suck? Right, like, you're, you're gonna have to do it to scale. And, it, and I will tell you, it makes a mad, like, it's a night and difference ROI. The big thing, though, to remember, when you do move your sales manager in, is a lot of sales managers, they'll want to get into basically like innovative energy. Oh, let's like make this new thing in the CRM. Let's make a new tracker. Let's like do all this new stuff. No, okay? All they do is QC and coach people. It's like the most boring, selfless job in the world. Right, that's why you also have to make it pay well. But they're just doing call reviews, call reviews, call reviews. Like they should almost damn near be listening to every single call. But managers, do not want to do QC. It's like, it's the equivalent of like, I don't know, it's like doing deadlifts in the gym. Like it sucks. Does that answer your question? Yeah. So would you say, but if someone's currently a player coach and then there's four clubs including them, would you demote them currently as a basic sales and then to work them back up so they have to be ready to pitch? Um, yeah, you, you have to pick one way or the other, right? I just think, I just think it's kind of inefficient now. So like maybe you just move them up or maybe you just move them back down or, or you know, whatever, you made a mistake and you gotta deal with it for now, just realize, okay, we're overpaying for the management, we're probably not gonna get that much out of it and we're just gonna have to like, you know, when he's ready for manager, we're gonna have to do a, a new, new, new thing. We got a question over here. Questions of mics only, by the way, guys. So. How are we on time, by the way? We're good. Well, like, how much Hour. left us? Hour? Yeah. Okay. Hour left. Yeah, you were talking about once we hit a cap, like say we're at, you know, 30 million a year, and then you start, um, you start getting into low ticket. I guess we were kind of selling low ticket at the back end, but people, I guess, how do you do it in a way where, like, it's separated people because we we got a lot of complaint, not complaints, but people were like, hey, I bought this, and you know, I thought it was the the mentorship or whatever, right. you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, how do you separate it? Well, quite, you're not quite frankly, I, I don't even think you guys should mess with that because you guys are so profitable off IG shoutouts and ads right now. I think you're still in a more phase. Just do more, more salespeople, more setters, and then also a back end. Like, do more to get everything out of you. Got like your your guys' return on ad spend is like, I, I'd be crying if I had that. You know, so you guys should just keep doing what you're doing. You know, don't 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 launch a new product to fix an imaginary problem. So I would just do more. Yeah, it seems to be kind of the way it's done where the person that's excelling in the role is automatically hierarchically moved up into the management role. But given that there's different skill sets involved, if you had to do it over again, would you actually give more open consideration to competent people in the role that might have the people management and coaching skills over above performance? for that role, because it seems like the top salesperson goes to sales manager almost automatically. Yeah, that's not always good. Um, I, I would just, I, I think when you're coaching the person, if, you're, if you have a good enough relationship with the sales team, you should know, like, is this person just, like, because there is some salespeople, they're not managers. You know, they are, I don't want to say they're selfless, like they're selfish, like they're bad people, but they're really good at the seek and destroy. But in terms of, like, a great way to think about it, is think of your people, and on a spectrum, there's like seek and destroy. It's like the tunnel vision. It's almost like, like the uh, Terrell Owens of the team, right? Like he's, he's a great player, but he's like kind of selfish, right? On the other side, there's, there's a high conscientiousness and like an awareness of the team and the energy of the team around them. So you want to find somebody with that balance. Obviously, you don't want somebody who, they need to be good at sales because they're going to be transferring that skill to somebody else. You promote the wrong person, then all of a sudden, they're all selling the wrong way. Yeah, so, so it's a balance. Yeah. And to be honest, like, I would always rather take probably the more skilled person and try to teach them management than taking somebody who's not as good at sales and then, you know, the rest of my team kind of stinking. Yeah, good point. Thanks, man. On your left here. 
Uh, you talked about a moment around stage three or four where you either have to step into the management or like you hire an operations person. Well, not at all. I mean, like an integrator. I mean, it's more, I mean, dude, this would be more of like a business partner almost. You're not going to throw up a LinkedIn ad right, but and, and have somebody run your company. What does that person just like split the stuff with you or they do like more meetings? Yeah, so or? think about it this way. Like right now, uh, my executives are kind of a whole set of integrators. You know, Mark, like through uh, Brian doing fulfillment and sales for RCA, Mitchell doing um, fulfillment and sales for SDA, Savannah doing basically operations and recruiting and kind of HR, and, Sav uh, and, and Sasha doing HR and finance, right? So they're kind of the ones who operate the company, right? I mean, and I, I'm involved. It's not like I like, don't do anything. You know, I'm involved, but my main thing is like, how do we strategize? and create new marketing and, and, and you know all that type of stuff. So it, it could just, it's just finding people who are going to keep like allow you to keep in more of the, the strategic part of your strengths and more of the visionary stuff who can run the company. But quite frankly, I, I think it's easier to just bite the bullet and just learn yourself and then eventually build these people up and then move back over. Because the other thing about you knowing how to do it yourself, even if you don't like it, is if you did hire somebody from the outside, how do you even know if they're actually good? Yeah. Because your skill set's not at an ability and a level in which you can inspect what you expect. Right. Yeah? Cool. Cool. Uh, let's do more, and then we'll, we'll continue. Well, I can pass it off if it's a question. I just wanted to validate this, because I wish you would have said this three months ago, because I just went through this trying to hold on to player coach, because he was my number one closer. Yeah. And I should have um, split the switch. And the key thing that, that stu stuck out for him is he wasn't just a great closer. He had high consciousness to his competence. He knew why he was a great closer. Mm. And he could, he could articulate it to other people. And so I was going through this ease off, volume knob approach and transitioning. And I was able to codify that he had uh, great coaching ability, so he could consciously, you know, connect with why people were deficient in their closing ability, and then he he constantly had good judgment on how to make people better. The problem was is that he was trying to maximize his earning potential as a closer while trying to find time to give people coaching. And what happened is that he only had time for people to inaccurately so, in hindsight, self-diagnose their problems and, and their closing deficiencies and try to coach them on what they thought was wrong rather than call reviews and telling them what was wrong and making them better. And so since we flipped the switch, it's painful, got to go through the dip, lose his closing, but, but now we're closing a, a deal a day at like 58% because all he does is like just, he's, he's a heat-seeking missile on getting his team to close mm, rather than himself. It makes a huge difference. Um, so the volume yeah, it, knob approach, because I always thought player coach, player coach. And my thing, my threshold when I was going to make the switch was well, when we get here on a consistent deal flow, I literally had a plan in place, do a quarter at this deal count average per month, and then you'll become manager. And really what I needed to do was the opposite. flip it. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, dude, it's, it's a really common mistake. And if you guys have a player coach and you're like, well, you know, it's like, it's, it's not, we're, we're, we're going to move on and we'll do questions. We'll, 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 we'll wake it up. We'll do a few questions. But yeah, it's like, um, it's, it's, if you have a player coach and you're hearing this and you're like, oh, you know, I think it's working you know, pretty well for us. Um, you just have never experienced what it's like to have an OG, like really great manager going all in on your team and almost reviewing like every single call. So anyways, we're going to move on here. So meeting sequence as you scale. You know, it's, I, I, when I first created this, I was going to show you how we run all our meetings and the cadences and everything. But you know, some of you guys, you might not be there yet to where you need to be doing a departmental meeting in all this complexity that kind of we're doing at this point. So in the beginning, when you have about eight people or less, OK, you're going to just have one meeting a day. And typically, what I would do is I theme these meetings. So it's a one company-wide meeting a day. And I probably alternate between, um, and this would be maybe if you had like one, like if you don't have a sales team yet, or maybe you have one salesperson, I'd alternate between a project-based meeting and then a sales training, okay? And then once you get one to two salespeople, you're gonna break that out and you're gonna do a two-meeting structure. So the two-meeting structure is you have sales, right? We already talked about how to run sales meetings. You got wins, announcements, um, projections, KPIs, and then uh, projects or uh, training. And then you're gonna run a meeting for fulfillment, ops, finance, and marketing, okay? The reason you're gonna split it out this way is fulfillment's a little bit borderline, but ops, finance, and marketing are all project-based departments. 
Sales is a performance-based department. Really, fulfillment is a performance-based department as well, but we can kind of tie that in with the uh, ops, finance, and marketing. So for the longest time, our company ran sales meeting and then ops, finance, marketing, and fulfillment all in one. Now, is this perfect? No. But at the same time, we had to do this because I was basically, the, you know, I was doing all the marketing. I was doing all the media buying. I was uh, doing one-on-one -on -one coaching calls. I was also running the sales team and running that second meeting. So I was doing so much that this is the only way I was going to be able to get everything all at once. Okay? But I will say, we did this for a long time until we didn't do it. And uh, this worked great for us. So I would recommend this would be a good one to transition into. And then that way you have a daily cadence with every single person within the company. Makes a huge difference too, okay? Also makes a huge difference in how you're gonna be grooming up your leaders. Then you're gonna to move to a professional structure. So this is kind of what we do now. We have sales meeting daily. We have marketing meeting uh, three times a week. We just don't have enough stuff to cover every single day, so we just do it three times a week. That's easier on my schedule too. And then fulfillment, ops, and finance meeting. Uh, they each have their, in, or sorry, fulfillment, ops, and finance is one meeting, but it's mainly fulfillment based. So ops and finance will come on and ask how they can support fulfillment, right? In terms of account receivables, in terms of uh, missed payments, all of that stuff. Finance has its own separate daily meeting, and then the executives meet twice a week. Does that make sense? So that's what we do now. Then the only other meetings we have in the company are, and we'll talk about this at the end, one-on-ones, initiative-based meetings, and then we have a once-a-month uh, team-wide sync for 60 minutes, okay? So uh, we'll cover all that in a second. So finance, this is everybody's favorite. Just kidding. Uh, so when you start, we talked about getting your bookkeeper, right? A lot of you guys, I mean, this is almost like every time, this is why I created this, you know, it'd be more fun to talk about like some really fancy marketing and persuasion stuff. But honestly, like every single time I, uh, when people are new in the boardroom, a lot of times they're, they're lacking in the finance department. So you have a bookkeeper at first, and then you're slowly going to transition that person into a controller. Now, I, I don't know what the, like, there's probably a million different definitions of this. My definition of that is basically somebody who's either part-time or full-time, who's really just managing all your finances in your company. Okay? Then you're going to transition that person eventually into a CFO, which is essentially the controller, but full time with a team under them. So like right now, Sasha has a, a, a bigger team under her because she can't do everything. All right? Now, so this is going to be somebody who's going to do the bookkeeping, the daily reconciliation. So what's daily reconciliation? Every expense that comes into your company every single day needs categorized of, you know, if it's an expense, is it marketing, uh, labor, or is it overhead? And then within each of those three main categorical expenses, what subcategory is it? Okay, uh, this is very important, especially also for daily reporting. They do that also with the cash flows. So we do that every single day. Um, they're gonna do your p and I'm gonna give you a template for that. But you're, they're gonna do your financial projections. So one thing that's really cool is we're able, for the most part, to project the amount of profit that we're gonna make plus or minus maybe five to 10% every single month. I'd say plus or minus five for the most part. We've gotten it within like 10 grand before. And so we're able, the same way we set projections for sales and we hit our projections, we're able to set projections for profit, for top line, for expenses, and more or less hit all of those projections. Okay, very, very, very key. And I, I will just tell you from experience, not many people do this. Balance sheet they're gonna do, they're gonna help you file your taxes. Your bookkeeper's not your tax person. Your bookkeeper organizes things for your tax strategist. Now, they could be the same person sometimes, but typically, they're not gonna be like your tax person. They're gonna do your AR tracking. So when you get, the bigger you get, especially if you're doing two, three, four, five pays, you know, there's a lot of payments. And that means a lot of missed payments, okay? So we have somebody full time who basically looks every single day what payments are due, and which actually go through. If any are declined, we automatically try half. So if it's like, let's say, a four grand payment, we'll try two grand. If that doesn't go through, we'll try 1K. Because right? a lot of times it's just a limit. So if, we, if 4K, 4K gets blocked, and then we do 2K twice in a row, we'll, we'll, we'll get the payment. That just eliminates all the back and forth. Okay? And then if, it, if we go all the way down, we don't get the payment, that feeds back into the CSM team on that one CSM meeting, and they say, hey, this person's missed a payment, and essentially that CSM will reach out and say, hey, 
this uh, didn't go through. Do you need to switch cards, or do you want us to run it again? Okay, because the AR, you guys would be surprised as you scale. AR is a huge lever of profitability. You know, when you have, you know, like we said, like with, with RCA, 340 clients a month, and then we got 100 clients a month with STA, and then we got boardroom. I mean, it's a lot of payments. So having somebody just on, I mean, we have a full-time person just for that. They're also going to do chargeback filing. Obviously, you know, you don't want to be doing that yourself. They're going to handle and, and, and receive refunds and also give people refunds. Uh, AR, you know, AR pretty much talked about that. Um, now, this is more COO, HR related activities. I have our CFO do this, which is payroll, employee contracts, all, run, all, run and track all of the commissions. Uh, lazy on with our legal team. Like we have an FTC attorney. We're going to have a telemarketing attorney. We have an asset protection attorney. Just all that type of stuff. Lazy on with that person. Lazy on with like your tax strategists and all that stuff. Uh, they're also going to do reimbursements. Like for instance, I have to reimburse all of my team for being here. That creates a massive amount of complexity, believe it or not. So they handle all of that. Also insurance. If you guys don't have insurance, make sure you get insurance and connect you with the right people. And then W-2. You know, W-2 also is like, it's not as simple as just doing it. Like you got to, it's kind of this whole thing you got to go through. So um, that's basically responsibilities there. Okay, uh, we're not going to go through this because it'd probably put you to sleep. But basically, here I have my financial projection sheet, our finance tracker, and then also our P&L structure, and then our payroll and commissions trackers. Okay, so essentially all of this, and there's a video in the course. It's already gotten uploaded today. It's under Eight Figure Operations, same title as this presentation, where I go over each of these trackers and how to use it. Okay, but this will uh, basically get your commissions like. I know the commissions are a big complexity. That'll streamline all of that for you. You'll have a P&L that you can actually read. You'll have um, the day-to-day -day finances, so you can see day-to-day -day cash flows, day-to-day -day incoming, day-to-day -day, uh, day -day are, and you'll have the financial projections, and you can see how we basically each month project out what our cash flow and what our expenses are going to be, and then actually hit that. So um, one thing about the P&L. A lot of times I tell people they, they need to do this, and they're like, oh, I have a bookkeeper. They already do that. And I'm like, okay, let me see the P&L. And for one, they can't find it. And for two, like, they cannot decipher this. It's like an Egyptian, you know, uh, what is it called, hieroglyph or whatever. It's like, they, like, they're like, wow, I don't really understand what this is. I'm like, what's your labor? And they're like, it takes us 30 minutes to know. I'm like, that's not, that's not good. Like, I can tell you what our labor is any time throughout the month of any day. So I don't, you know, th there's a difference. When you hire a bookkeeper, okay, this is very key, so listen to this. If you hire a bookkeeper, there's a difference between them putting stuff together in the right way to file taxes, okay? I don't care about that. I just want to pay as low as taxes as possible, so do whatever you got to do. There's all, but there's a difference between that and a difference between the report that they give me because I want a report that gives me information extremely clearly so I can able to pivot and make decisions off of that report. And from my experience, very few people have that because I can look at your P&L especially if you're a more mature company, and I can tell you basically what you need to do to scale. That and looking at your kind of marketing and sales metrics, I, I can tell you 100%, almost without fail, what you need to do to be able to scale and what your constraints are. So if that's the decision-making framework that I'm using for my company, like you guys need to be using that for you and get, and get associated with like, the, especially when you start doing this every single month, month after month, it's like building a muscle. And you start to see, OK, like my labor is around here. That's good. That's bad. My ads expenses, like, oh, OK, we're getting killed with this. It used to be this. It's, it's one of the most important things you can do. Nobody does it. So you guys have the tracker. You'll see exactly how I set it up, which is, I, I kind of just typed it out here uh, just for ease. You're going to have cash in minus refunds. That's going to be your gross cash. Then you're going to have expenses, labor, marketing, overhead, OK? So labor is part-time, full-time contractors, W-9 and uh, W-2, between marketing, sales, operations, fulfillment, and executives. Marketing is just ads and referral payouts. Okay, That's not your agency. That's labor. Just ads. Then overhead is insurance, legal, and uh, events, and software, and office expense. Okay, And also uh, your payment processor, like 3%. So and then after that, that's going to give you your NOI. So typically, I recommend trying to hit at least above a 40% NOI, net operating income, after labor marketing and, and overhead. Now, NOI is calculated. The expenses above that are the only essential expenses that are required to run the company. 
So like boardroom doesn't go in there, right? Boardroom's gonna go in this other section, okay? Uh, your coaches, uh, your rent, like your tax write-offs, all of that stuff that's really not acquired expenses to run the day-to-day -day operations, we're gonna put under net operating income, which at the very bottom is gonna give us our net net. Does that make sense? Okay, so this is very, very key because what happens here is people have like the rent and like, you know, I have like a captive insurance company which I gotta pay a bunch of money into a month. Like, I don't want that in my, in my net operating, like factored into my net operating income. It doesn't tell a real good truth in terms of how the company's actually doing. So when you have this and then you start doing it every single month, bam, 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 it's like a muscle that you build and I'm telling you tremendously, yeah, this will help you so much. You will be so much more profitable. You know, as the saying goes, what, get, what's get, uh, what gets okay. measured gets improved or whatever the hell it is. But again, like if you actually know what your profit is and you actually really know, you're not just, oh, yeah, it's this. You actually really know it's gonna get better. So all of those trackers are in there. And then on top of that, the video in the course will kind of break through how to, how to do it all and all that stuff. How are we doing on time? 22 minutes. Cool. Anybody have questions on finance? Boring, but important. No, it's, it's going to be too hard because there's too much, rec like the P&L is going to be reconciled once a month. Right. It takes us about eight days after the month to get last month's P&L because a lot of the payroll goes out on the fifth. You said something, I don't recall. That's, that's your da daily reconciliation of all cash flows and expenses. Okay, right, so anything that's going in and out of the credit card or the, the bank account needs like bam, 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 reconciled. I have a quick question on meetings. Yeah, sure. Do you delegate between tactical meetings, strategic meetings? No. Well, we have a few different types of meetings. We're gonna cover that at the end. So. What's your target net net? Uh, you know, for us, like, still probably about 40. Yeah. Yeah. About 40. But it just depends too. Like, if I invest like a bunch of money into a mastermind one month, that's gonna affect the net net. You see what I mean? So I, I focus more on NOI because that that teaches me how efficient my machine is. You see what I mean? Spencer. Uh, I don't know. Probably like five to eight grand a month. Yeah. Yeah, you, you, you put it in labor. Now, personally, I don't do that. So if I had to do it over again, you know, I would put my comp in the labor section. Um, but I don't do it because I just want to keep the numbers consistent at this point. But yeah, you should put yours in there because if you hire somebody to do what you do, it's, you're, you're going to, like, the way you should do this, if you read, uh, it's not Profit First, what is the book? No, I'll, I'll think of it. Um, it's Simple Numbers, Straight Math, or something like that. But if you, if you read that, like, if you're, like, let's say the marketing director and you're the CEO, you need to pay yourself for both of those roles because it establishes what's the current company market value for when you give those roles away. I, I never did that, but I wish I would have done that in hindsight. Because then it's like, you can literally just transfer that to the person that you hire, and it just makes sense. And your company's built around that, opposed to it's built around you doing 100 jobs, and then you're trying to make room for these new people. Sarah? No, we're like, uh, I mean, we're still like 50% NOI. Yeah, you just gotta scale the right way. Raise your price. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, so, so you mentioned you do some use of your silver or silver brands as well as less. But I'm curious on your contractors and employees. Are you filing reports in each state? Are the same coming after you yet? Because we're experiencing that. I have no idea. Uh, that's a Sasha question. I think we're I, we're W two on most people though. Except for, Except for sales team. Sasha, you want to cover? Yeah. So it really comes down to control, right? Are you controlling their hours? Are you controlling how they do the work? Are they controlling when they do the work? Where they do the work? Um, so we do W two for like the salaried employees that are ops where it's really like you need to be available nine to five, right? Monday through Friday. So we have control, right? So yes, we're registering in every single state and every single state's completely different. Um, but for other people where they have the freedom to make their own schedule, open their calendar for different um, calls, when they're taking calls, how they're taking calls, um, 
like the account managers, you know, that kind of meet with you guys and they make their own schedules. So those remain 1099. And, uh, Okay. Interesting. Um, usually there's a threshold. Usually there's a threshold where you don't have to pay that. They can generate up to a certain point, and then there, when they're beyond that threshold, then that's where you pay. So I would definitely consult your tax expert that's doing that because there is an exemption point um, that's pretty generous, so you shouldn't be having to do that. Um, is there, those people are residing in Texas, right? And that's why you're having to pay that? Gotcha. Um, yeah. Let me look into it and get back to you because there is a threshold. I'm not sure. There's ways around, there's definitely ways around that with an advanced tax uh, strategist. Yeah. Let's, uh, let, let's try to finish. So, so let's hold on for the questions. Uh, OK, so marketing, a couple things. So with marketing, right now, we have content team, which is three people. We, have, we used to have a marketing director, let him go. And then um, copywriter, emails, uh, Facebook group posts. Helps me with some of the copy, but I still primarily write uh, most of it. And then um, a media, full-time media buyer, and then a marketing ops person. OK? So three times a week. And then here's the meeting cadence that we do for that. And it's very, very similar to some of the other meeting cadences I'm going to show you for your other teams. So basically, same as sales. They come on, they do wins. Then we do what's called budgets and projections. OK? That's all going to be in this sheet here. Um, this, this is a behemoth of a sheet. And so again, similar to the, the finance sheets, the video in the course I have will explain how to, how to use all that. But essentially, what we do is we look at the proje we make projections every single month on every single channel and then also on the combined total. So like for SDA, we're running on Facebook, we're running on YouTube. We also have a different offer. It's like a different funnel on Facebook, so we track KPI separately for that. We track email, SMS, we track cold outbound dialing because we have like cold callers and we track cold email. And then we have a division total projection off the back of that. So all that will go in there. So similar to how we go through on the sales team and we go through projections and KPIs, what we do here is we do wins, and then we go through the, uh, the budgets and projections. We make sure we're budgeting on pace, uh, marketing qualified applications, all of that stuff's on pace, closes on pace, CPAs on pace. So we look at all of those metrics. And then after that, we go to Asana. So for any project-based team, which is finance, marketing, and operations. What you're going to do is have an Asana board that's specifically for marketing meeting, operations meeting, finance meeting. And you're going to have all the tasks of all the people that you basically assigned and delegated for them to do. And so when you have a daily cadence to that, that is going to help you get all of these projects across the line very efficiently. And so the way you set that up is you have the name of the task, you assign it to a person, and then what you do is you do OTA when why. Okay? So OTA when why is, first of all, what is the outcome? Like, clearly, what is the thing that needs to be accomplished? T is tracking. So how are we going to measure that thing? Or how are we going to know it's done? A is who, who's accountable for it. Y is why is it important in the first place? So like, when people know why something is important, opposed to just being assigned something willy-nilly, they have a better intentionality on doing it correctly. Okay? Then we do when. So when is it going to be due? And a lot of times, what I do, so after we go through all of that, and I don't always, I, you know, I don't always write out O T A Y whatever. But like, I just want to make sure the instructions or and or the Loom video have all of that all together. Okay, so we go through all of that, and then I always ask people, when do you? I don't assign it like get it done by this. I say, when do you think you can get this done by? Now, what you want to watch out for is by the end of the week, or by the end of the day. Right? If they say by the end of the week, like th those are just triggered responses. They're like reflexes. So if they say by the end of the week, I'm going to think, like, how long is this really should take? And I might say by the end of the day or by Wednesday. You know? If it's by the end of the day, 
And it's a really, really simple thing. I might just say, after this meeting, can you just block something off and get this done in 10 minutes? So that's how you collapse time on all these projects. Does that make sense? Cool. So if you guys check out the video that's in the course for this, you have budgets, projections, master tracker, audits, all of that stuff. Another thing that we do, and I don't know, maybe some other people do this, but we essentially, as you'll see in this audit sheet, we basically grab for one, for SDA and RCA, we do two different audits, every single marketing channel and every single campaign, and then we look at seven, 14, and 30-day metrics, and also 14 and 30-day CPA. So we look at CPL, CPBC, which is cost per book call, and CPA, and we basically map that all out, which making decisions, we do this once a week, making decisions when you have it all mapped out in Google Sheets like that, is tremendously easier than trying to go into the ads manager and be like, yeah, like I think we should turn this one off. And, and you're like scrolling up and down, and Hyros is like glitching on your computer. It's so much easier to just put everything in the sheets uh, one by one. And you can also verify the data to make sure it's correct, make sure the attribution's correct. And then what we do is we, once a week, unless we got to make like really fast pivots, once a week typically we'll do all of our optimization. So this is huge. And we haven't really ever taught this in the program, but like uh, our old marketing director, when he would do some one-on-ones, he, he would show how we do the audits to folks, and they said it was a game changer. So uh, any figure operations is gonna be in the course. You'll see how I go through that. It takes a little bit, uh, it takes a little bit of time. So operations tech. Quick question on that. How, how, would, you, how would you structure that if you're working with an agency? Well, yeah, you're not gonna do the audit. I mean, if you're working with an agency, it's like they should be kind of making those optimization type decisions for you. Okay. Yeah. With the agency, what you want to do is make sure you have a, a clear cadence and then probably go through more of the budgets and projections. So it's like you have a clear meeting cadence and you're going to meet at X times a week and you're going to go through these KPIs and anything that they did last week and then what they're planning on doing this week. Okay. That last week, this week is a good framework. So you can actually make sure they're like thinking through stuff and like there's a degree of proactivity or what they say they're going to do last week, they actually did it. Yeah. So that's, that's working with all contractors. Typically, one to three times a week meetings, define the KPIs last week, this week. I mean, at the minimum, if you just do that, you'll get way more out of your contractors. So team structure for operations. So like our operations assistants, tech, stuff like that, they meet once a day. They go over wins, announcements, Asana. Asana is exactly the same as I just explained to you. And then also what we do, and I show this in the video that's in the course, is essentially in Slack, we have an operations channel that basically has a work order thing to where it populates up and we submit a work order and that auto populates into Rosana. So that's a good way instead of just like, you know, if like you've been an operations person, you probably know like people are just, you got 900 people asking you for 900 things, right? This makes it organized to where it's like they just bang in Asana, go all in there and then they can, they can delegate it as needed. So it's very big. We learned that one from Edward. And then the executive team, two meetings a week. So for us, again, this is Sasha, Brian, Mitchell, Savannah, and me, right? But for you guys, this could be your, your, your sales director, your client success director, your CFO, COO, HR, you know, whoever that is, and your marketing director and you, okay? Or any of the combination of those positions. So what we do is we have two different cadences. We meet twice a week. On Mondays, we go over what we did last week, what we're gonna do this week, what our personal projections are versus where we're at, if we're on pace, not on pace, if we're not on pace, why we're not on pace. And then we go over any urgent items that need addressed. And then same as the other uh, meetings, we go over Asana. Everybody's favorite is the Asana. And then on Wednesdays, this is very key with your mission, vision, and values. On Wednesdays, we go over one core team uh, values acknowledgement. So we'll, out of all of our teams, like I'll te technically be over the marketing still, but over like you know sales fulfillment, all that stuff, they'll bring one person and one thing they did that week to exemplify one of the values. So this is very important because number one, they know they're gonna have to do this every single Wednesday. And so now they're looking at their teams and thinking, are they following the values? And this also creates a cadence where we're constantly talking about the values. Because it's one thing to create mission and vision and values. There's another thing to actually live it. You know, you can create something in a Google Doc that sounds really good. It's totally different if you actually practice it. Cool. And so we go through that. Then we'll go over any team members that are struggling. Then we'll go over a quick recap of like different people on the team. So like just recapping like five different people on the team. The reason we do that is because we're at a, such a big scale now to where like Savannah, for instance, will have no idea what's going on with certain people on the sales team. Like things start, the bigger you get, things start to become siloed. 
So you have to communicate of what's going on in each other's departments, which is why we do all kind of these little activities here at the beginning, so people can stay in sync. Right, because the executive team is the hardest team to keep in sync, rowing in the right direction. Because they're the leaders of their own departments and they become siloed. Then we'll go over Asana, that's Wednesday. How are we doing on time? Time? Cool, anybody have questions on that? Uh, what about uh, meeting frequency as you grow? Uh, do you feel that it's better to and the frequency early on because that's what grows you or, or you're just going to have to meet more frequently as you grow. Yeah, it's this one right here. So like at first, we just did one meeting a day, right, with everybody. Then we did two meetings a day. We did sales meeting and we did everybody else. And then from there, we just slowly broke out more meetings as needed. So eventually, like marketing had to do a meeting. Eventually, finance had to do a meeting. Yeah, I, I guess a better question would be like, we, we do a lot of this, but we're not meeting daily. Yeah, I would rather do less of the different types of meetings and meet daily. Yeah, I just think that daily cadence is really, really good, especially when you're smaller. It just gets, it gets the team working together. It, it creates like a rhythm. Yeah, yeah, you need some meetings. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think I think I think I, I would I would experiment with in. No, in team yeah, I would I would man, I would experiment with increasing the frequency of the meetings. And then the other thing you could do too is like if you're like man, like well, the operations department we need like 20 minutes here. The other thing we need 20 minutes there. Then you could just combine those into one meeting. Like if it's not enough to justify a finance meeting or an operations meeting, you could still have them meet together. You can go over finance stuff real quick, send them off the meeting, then go over operations stuff, send them off the meeting. And then also like. It creates a unison in your team when they're not just like working, like, oh, I know, who you, I know you from Slack. It's like they actually have like a cadence, you know, and they can see everybody. You know, a lot of people, they, like, you know, when they reminisce, a lot of times I notice, they talk about that time when we had one daily meeting with everybody. Yeah, because it's just like they see everybody in the company. They think it's really cool. So I, w I would experiment with increased frequency. But cool. just don't, like, you should never... Like, don't be just sitting on a meeting like bullshitting. Like, our meetings are like super fast. We try to get the F off those as fast as possible, but like, they're very efficient and like, we do shit. Like, we're not messing around, you know? So it's not like, oh, like, you know, death by meeting and like people who hate meetings, they hate like meetings where nothing gets freaking accomplished and they're just talking. You know, we're like Asana, project, 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 project. Okay, done, everybody goodbye. You know, it's very fast. So, Cole, do you recommend interdepartment meetings, like the head, like sales meeting with operations or sales meeting with fulfillment? Like, no, sales meeting is always separate. No, no. I mean, do you rec do you recommend that the head of sales meet with the head of fulfillment to? Uh, that's yeah, one dude, of the things uh, we've been trying so, to do to address so, the So they would they would technically meet on the executive meetings. So, like two exact meetings could replace the need for that. Yeah, the only but, reason I mean, we're doing that is for that siloed thing to help. Build. Yeah, so I mean, the, the executive meetings will help with that. But the other thing you could do is one to two uh, departmental sync meetings a week, yeah. which I actually didn't list that on here. We do do a lot of that stuff. So when we have different departments who have different meetings, but they're run by different managers, what we do is uh, interdepartmental sync meetings one to two times a week. And that could be with the entire team, or that could just be the managers. Okay. Yeah. And you know, like if you're having one of those meetings, you should be, it's like, okay, I understand like what I'm going to cover on those meetings, if that makes sense. Cool. So other meetings that we have, we have initiative based meetings. So we have the interdepartmental sinks. I actually didn't even add that to this, but that's a good one. We do have those two. Initiative based meetings. So as you can see, almost all the projects we do are basically covered with Asana, right? Now what happens is there's certain projects that are too big for us. Like you can't just cover it on a meeting. So what you got to do is you got to create a new meeting for that initiative. So for instance, when we built the cold email, cold outbound, cold calling initiative, right? Not our setters that we teach you guys how to do. It's like calling people who have no idea who you are. When we built that, we, we had to create a new meeting for that because we're not just going to knock that out in five minutes on a meeting. So that warranted another meeting. Does that make sense? Uh, when, we, when we brought in our first internal recruiter, we had to do one meeting of that a week, like to get that person going. When we, brought in, when we started uh, having events, we had to do an events initiative meeting a week. Does that make sense? So when you have these big initiatives, 
what happens is, and I'm sure you guys have all experienced this, where you, you talk with your team, something sounds really good, oh yeah, let's do it. You have an offsite, you're like, oh yeah, let's do this, oh, that'd be amazing, it doesn't happen. Right? Once you go back to the day-to-day -day rhythm of your company, essentially it falls by the wayside. These initiative meetings, this cadence, keeps it, it pushes it through. Okay, very important. Um, Team-wide structure once a month. So this and the offsite is the last thing I'll cover. So one of the most important things that we do is, especially when your company gets very big, you meet all together once a month, everybody. So all 90 people or whatever it is on there once a month, okay? Now the structure of this is essentially in the morning, I will write the entire company a memo in Slack. I recommend everybody do this. I learned this from Ryan Dice. It was really, really, I really am glad that I started doing this. And this forces you to review publicly with the team the last 30 days, your KPIs, your projections, your wins, your accomplishments, your acknowledgments, and your areas of improvement. Right? So like, here's, you know, here's uh, what we projected, here's what actually happened. Here's our wins, accomplishments, acknowledgments, here's some people on the team who went above and beyond and exemplified these values by doing this, and here's where we stuck. Okay? <laughs> then we, do, we cover the next 30 days which is the projections and the areas we want to focus on and our new initiatives. And I also expand and cover like the next 90 days to a year. I just add in any extra vision stuff I can because everybody wants to, everybody wants to hear that. And I will tell you this, like, especially with your vision and where you're going, you know, Patrick Lencioni, who's like the best person you could read his books on this stuff, says that like you should feel like you're beating a dead, uh, beating a dead horse. Like you're just, like you should be the king of repetition. And I cannot tell you enough, you will think your team knows your vision, they do not know your vision. Like the simplest things that you're gonna do in the next 90 days, little initiatives, they have no freaking clue. You have to just repeat yourself constantly, almost to the point where you're wondering if you're being a little bit annoying. Okay, then at the last little bit of that meeting, We'll do 20 minutes of different people on the team acknowledging somebody else on the team and a value that they exemplified. So again, this starts reminding the team what are the values and what actions like, are in alignment with those values. Does that make sense? So again, we do the review, first 40 minutes, and the acknowledgments in that last 20, it's an hour, and I write the memo in the morning. I think all you guys should do this, even if you have like eight people. I would do, our team gets like so pumped after this. They're like DM me on Slack. I'm, like, I'm, I'm ready to run through a brick wall. Like they're like so pumped. <laughs> so it's really, really good. And like, I'll be honest. Like you know, there, there was a time where our company, like we were just breaking rec We broke records in terms of revenue. I think for like 12 months in a row, maybe even more than that. Like we we broke records every single month. And then we hit a few shit storms, and we started declining. And some people we churned some people, and some people left. And uh, you know, we we weren't doing as good as we were doing. You know, and people start wondering, oh, is everything okay? Like, what's going on? Uh, why did so-and-so leave? This is, this is my opportunity to address all of these things once a month. It is, it is very important. It might not be as important when you're winning. It's still important, you still do it. But when you, when you take some uh, black eyes, this is key. And you gotta be radically transparent with what's going on. This person left, why'd they leave? This person, you know, I'll always be positive. We're not like shit talking to anybody. But the transparency is king, and that's what everybody says. They're like, man, I can't believe I work for this company that's so transparent. Cool? So last thing, how are we doing on time? We're done? Yeah. Can I add something to that really quick? Yeah, sure. So another really important thing about like you guys communicating the vision to your employees is that is what attracts A players. Because what happens is your team will begin to communicate that vision to other people in the industry. And so a big re not to like self-diagnose myself as an A player, but I like to think I, I do well. Oh, but bring the ego down a little bit, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> but, but anyway, like the reason why I was like, I'm going to go apply to work for Cole is because the, mis the vision of the company was so well communicated across the industry that I was like, well, there's nobody else who is like, I was it has as a big a vision as this company. And so like you guys communicating that to your team as well will also communicate that to attracting more and more top level people. Nice, so we're, we're, I don't wanna get super behind, we're gonna wrap up there, but one thing I will say is I know like learning about finance and the marketing meeting and uh, you know the operation, it's, it's not the most fun stuff, like believe me, the sale, talking about sales and marketing and funnel, you know, it's, it's more fun. But I will tell you guys from experience of working with everybody, this is probably the biggest area improvement for everybody, which is why I wanted to uh, present it to you guys, okay? So a lot of, you know, some of this stuff's a little bit monotonous, but it's very, very important. 
and it's the exact thing y'all got to focus on when you're getting into this and you're at 300 grand a month trying to get to a million a month or 500k a month trying to get to a million a month. So hope you guys enjoyed it and uh, we'll move on to the next speaker. Let's, uh, let's welcome Cole Gord and the Big Daddies here again to rock your world. All right, go ahead. Yeah. It's pretty good sound. All right. Cool. All right, we're doing some Q&A. So I think, so this was the best, Igor, so this was the best questions from the breakouts. All right. So uh, the first one we have is Sophie. You were asking, what are the top three biggest mistakes you see clients making, and what do you recommend we can do to avoid them? Do you have anything you want to add to that question? Yeah, can you give me an example of something that's distracted you in the past? Or, or, or something maybe you see other people do? Um, they get a bit working at A level, and then they go, oh, when I heard that TikTok has been really rocking it right now. Yeah. Right. Okay, so I got the answer. Yeah, so, so everything we do in our company is based on like the theory of constraints. Who knows what the theory of constraint is? Uh, Elrond Golrad. I think there's a book called The Theory of Constraints. The goal. There you go. Yeah, so the reason, you know, if you guys have ever done a call with me and I look at your numbers, and I really want to figure out what your marketing system is, what your offer is, what your funnel is, and then I look at those numbers, and, you know, like I get really, I get really particular that the numbers are in the, the right format, you know? The account managers know if, if, you, if they don't get your guys' numbers, I get kind of upset. So the reason I do that is because when you're coaching somebody, it's like there's all these like stories and narratives that are like wrapped into what you guys think the problem is. But what I want to do is just look at the numbers and figure out what is the actual constraint that, if alleviated, would allow you to scale to the next level. Or what is the one, two, three, like the, the first constraint and then the constraint after that constraint's alleviated, and then the constraint after that one's alleviated, that if all three of those are alleviated, you guys could get a double, or you know, depending on the revenue level, maybe a 30 or 50% increase, right? So for, for me, in our company, and it's much harder to do on yourself, for sure, because you have all this narrative wrapped into it. But for us, I look at those numbers, you know, it's not just something I do for y'all, I look at those numbers, and I really see like, what is the constraint that we have right now, and then all of the new initiatives and new, uh, essentially new activities need to be focused on alleviating that constraint. So like for instance, there was a time with uh, SDA where I could look at our funnel and the, you know, the, the cost per book call was rising up, the cost per lead was rising up, you can kind of tell like we probably need to rejig some stuff with the ads, we need to influx new creatives, but the ROAS overall was still pretty good. And so instead of focusing on redoing the marketing funnel or redoing all of the ads, the real constraint was that like our recruiting and our fulfillment team was always like right to the brim of capacity. Right? So we're going to keep that to where it is, and we're going to focus on just the one thing that's going to alleviate that constraint that is going to help us get to the next level. So I would say the biggest thing to keep focused is just knowing actually what your constraint is. You know, one of the things I tell the account managers is the clients usually, um, it's not that they know what the problem is and they don't know what to fix or they don't know how to fix it. A lot of times they're just trying to fix the wrong problem. Right? So what you need to help them do is shed light on a proper diagnosis. Because once you're clear on what the problem is, it's usually pretty easy to know what the solution is. Does it make sense? Right? So that's what I would think about with you guys is, and the account managers can give you those set of numbers, and then the, the training is called, I think, Diagnosing and Fixing Constraints. It's like in the very first uh, week. And that's where I go through my thinking process of like all of these different scenarios of what could happen with these numbers and the actions I would take to alleviate that constraint. And it could be new marketing, could be better marketing, could be increasing the close rate, could be adding certain people on fulfillment, it just depends. So does that help your question? Does anybody have questions on the, just that thread?
Okay. Everybody had a couple drinks last night. Um, so we'll go to Matt here. I'd love to learn more about how exactly you're using high risk for maximum benefit in your marketing. And you said details. In our recent one-on-one, -on -one, you said the route hires, your ads wouldn't even work. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Yeah. So Matt Kaufman, do you want to? Uh, anything else you want to add to that question? No. Yeah. So 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 basically, here's so for the longest time when we had that direct SDA funnel, uh, the the one we still run today, I could not get that to work. And a big reason is, like, we're going after pretty much the most competitive market there is, which is like the coach, coaches, consultants, and agencies. And we have to get people who are making enough money and have leads to where they need sales reps, right? So affluent, very competitive, and very small TAM, right? So it's like, it, it's, it's the hardest market to go after by far, right? So what happens is, thankfully, our price point's really high, so we can make those numbers work. But the problem is, is that like the cost per lead to operate in that market is like $100 to $200. So if we're spending five grand a day, let's say, we need to make sure you get enough pixel fires per campaign, per ad set, or sorry, if you're doing CBO, it'd be enough pixel fires per campaign, per, campaign, uh, per week for that to be able to optimize. So it's typically 30 to 50 pixel fires per campaign, per week. Does that make sense? So the problem is, is with the Facebook pixel, it has around a three to 10 matching, a three of 10 matching. So out of like your 10 conversions, you're only gonna get 30% of them, right? Whereas Hyros, you can get up to about seven to 10. And then we haven't tested this yet, but Parkinson said with uh, state IO plus Hyros, you can get nine out of 10. So what happens is the reason our ads, hopefully this is gonna make sense, I come full circle. The reason our ads wouldn't work without it is number one, we wouldn't have attribution of knowing where to put the budget, so that's the obvious one. But the other one is we use, we optimize for Hyros lead, and without that Hyros lead event, we wouldn't have enough pixel fires per, per week, per campaign, to be able to optimize. So when we were using the Facebook pixel, we could not get it to work. When I switched to the Hyros pixel, we got it to work because there was enough pixel fires. Now, in most markets where you're doing like 10 or $20 leads and it's, it's a regular market, you're probably getting enough pixel fires per week, even with just with the Facebook pixel. Does that make sense? But with ours, we, get, like we pay 200 bucks a lead, but our VSL converts at 50%, so you know, our co cost per call could be $300, it's still pretty good. So at 200 bucks a lead, we're only getting, like I checked last week, like 40 leads. So we need to make sure all of those are feeding back into the AI. Does that make sense? Yeah. Does that make sense to everybody else? That's, that was a little bit weird question. Why would you get more pixel fires with the higher pixel? The matching rate is higher, What's right? So it's like, if you use the Facebook pixel, out of 10 conversions, only three will show up, okay? With, with Hyros, on average, it's like seven out of 10 will actually show up and get logged correctly and get logged under the right campaign. Does that make sense? So everybody thinks about it from an attribution standpoint, but we also think about it from an optimization standpoint because that's allowing us to feed back the, the correct data. And it doesn't always work better, but in our case where we're doing running $200 leads that are really quality leads, we have to make sure, because otherwise, like, you know, the Facebook pixel will tell us we're getting $1,000 leads, right? And there's no data uh, going back into the pixel. And so instead of it, the, like the algorithm optimizing, that forces Facebook to use a display function. So it just sprays and prays the ad, opposed to understanding a feedback loop of who you're going after and then zeroing in. So that's the other reason too, with our, with our audiences for SDA, we literally just target like an audience of 10 million, and then I try to feed the pixel as much data as it can do, and then it zeroes in on the audience that we want based on the messaging and the creative. That's why the targeting is dictated on the messaging, not the actual targeting. Okay, YouTube is different, and I found YouTube, you, you do need to really split out the targeting. Would you recommend setting up the higher pixel community as soon as you start using Facebook ads? Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I think if you're running like $200 leads, $100 leads like we are, yeah, I don't think you have a choice. If you're, if you're getting like, like for RCA, we can get 10, 20, $30 leads. With that, you know, we could start with the Facebook pixel, let the high risk pixel season, and then switch it over and do a split test. Because sometimes with RCA, we have not found the high risk pixels better. But like if the alternative, like with SDA, if we don't use it, we get no data. So there's no optimization. Does it make sense? Yeah. Does it make sense to everybody else? I know that's like some nerdy technical ad stuff. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I would do it as soon as you could afford it. It's like probably one of the most essential tools, tools that we use in our company. Yeah, so it's, it's pretty hard to not use it. And there's some other tools. I would ask Parkinson, like, he would know, I think there's another one that... Segmetrics. Segment, yeah, so there, I, I would ask, maybe ask him in the group, Segmetrics versus Hyros, what does he like, why does he like it? But yeah, you gotta use one of those for the most part. Cool. Anybody else have... Oh, can you can you elaborate on that? I'm confused. Like, do you, do you for me like optimizing down the funnel from marketing through to sales has, has been really helpful. And so I'm wondering if we pipe the data of conversion metrics and attribution, you know, CPA back with our sales. Metrics. So are you saying like, uh, are we? Are, are we data onto your other data dashboards? Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully it answers your question. Okay, cool. Anybody else? Just for clarification, the, the Hyros pixel works better because the Facebook pixel has data errors? It, it just doesn't. So again, if you get 10 conversions, Facebook might catch three. If you get 10 conversions, Hyros is probably going to catch seven. It's because of the iOS change. Like, right. Facebook's tracking way worse. Yeah, it's really bad. Yeah, so what happens is like, you know, with SDA, we're getting $200 leads, and to get to get 50 conversions per week per campaign at a CBO level, you know, that's going to be at $200 leads. Like, I mean, we're, you know, we're spending like three. We had to get, spend like three grand a day per campaign. See what I mean? And so we have to make sure. And that's that's with the high risk one. You know, with with the Facebook Pixel, it's like we're getting $1,000 leads. So like to get. You know, we have to spend seven thousand dollars, seven thousand dollars a day to technically get enough optimization. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's a little that's a little nuanced, but literally it wouldn't work. Like it, we could not get it to work until I I I knew it was a data thing. I was like, ah, oh, you know, there's just not enough stuff feeding back into the pixel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you just gotta step up and you know throw some budget at it, dude. You gotta, yeah, like we we test it like we literally test it like two grand a day or three grand a day. Like we go like I, I would rather I put a lot of uh, like for instance I think one of the one of the tests we used to do we spent like the test was five campaigns at a thousand a day, and then I was like we only need two of these to work for this test to be successful. I could trim the other ones. You know, so that's what I see. Obviously, it's it's different when you know if you're like bootstrapping pretty hard, you you might have to just deal with running a couple hundred bucks a day and just trying to figure it out and narrow it narrow it down based on the targeting. But like, dude, you have enough money to where you should be like for the funnel you just launched, you should be like, yeah, we're just gonna throw thirty grand at this and just like, you know, it's just data. Like we're not even gonna expect sales. So, so Facebook says 30 to 50 conversions per week per campaign of CBO or per, per ad set of ABO to give the algorithm enough like a feedback loop to optimize, right? So most of your targeting does not come from you selecting the targeting. Most of your targeting comes from like there's a big pull of audience and then some conversions start to come in and start a feedback loop starts to establish and they start to understand the demographics and psychographics of who's responding to this most favorably and then they take this big audience and then they zero in on a very small pocket, right? And that's why like there's, uh, you know, one of our ads mentors taught us this thing called pocket theory. So what we'll do is we'll have, we'll, we'll, we'll run the same audience, which is like 10 million. And then what I'll do is I'll basically have five different campaigns and they all have slightly different messaging, okay? So the audience is the same, but one will be recruiting for like agencies, let's say. Another one will be recruiting for coaches. Another one will be like recruiting for closers, not setters. The other one will be, you know, I could, maybe it's like increase your closing rate, right? And so you see how those, those are different messaging, same audience, but I'm gonna hit different pockets. Does that make sense? So that's called, uh, I learned that from Jason Hornon, that's called scaling spherically, 
right? Because you're, you're, you're scaling with pockets within the same audience, opposed to trying to find a new audience. Or even a new, like a new audience or, a, uh, or, or vertically trying to scale the existing budget that you have in the existing pocket, right? There's three ways to scale. There's vertical scaling, horizontal scaling, and what I just told you is spherical. Does it make sense? I could see, I could see you thinking about it. You're processing. Yeah, I mean, dude, but in your situation, I would, you know, i just man up and throw some budget at it, you know? Four grand a day. Four grand a day, a couple campaigns, and uh, test based on the angle. Did you have a question? Yeah, so that's, uh, yes, so that's Facebook server-side conversions yeah. or something like conversion API server-side. Yeah. So you could use that too, and that's another thing you could test, and then that way you can get the matching rate up on the Facebook pixel, and then instead of using the high-res pixel, use the Facebook pixel. Because sometimes, like we've found with Google, if there's enough data on both sides, sometimes the Google pixel wins. So it just, and even uh, Becker says to test both. Like, that's one of the things in the instruction manual. He's like, I can't guarantee this is going to work better. It's just like, you got to split test it. But if you, you know, in our situation where we had no data, obviously using the high res pixel worked better. Okay. Big, big thread on that one. Uh, next question. So, again, Matt Kaufman, what is your approach to testing new Facebook ads covered in part of the training? And what KPIs do you evaluate to use ad tests? Do you want to elaborate on that at all? Simultaneous that are all new. And yeah. I'm curious how you approach that testing Okay. So this is basically similar to what we just talked about. But essentially, number one, you gotta have an investment mindset, right? So the same way you invest into, you know, being in this room and you're looking to get something out of it, you gotta select like, okay, I'm gonna invest 20k in this campaign to get data. Right? And so you gotta go in like, I don't care if I lose 20 grand. Right, and this is if you're uh, obviously you know you have the the money to be able to do that. Keep in mind too, if you if you do a pretty good job, you'll probably at least make what two sales at 10k or three sales at 7k or whatever your price point is, and you'll break even. Obviously, that's not the row is that you want, but like you're liquidating the test, and that's like a worst case scenario. Usually, no matter what, we're still going to close like something off this. So, anyways, I, I would you, you got to have a good testing budget, right? And then out of that, what you want to do is you want to let's say you could spend for your testing four grand a day. Well, you want to take your target cost per lead, and you want to see okay. How many campaigns can I do based on hitting at least 30 fires per campaign per week, right? So you might determine that you can do four campaigns at 1,000 a day, and you know based on your target cost per lead of being $80 or something, that's going to hit 32 conversions per week per campaign. Does that make sense so far? So now the question becomes, do you, like, how are those four campaigns different, right? So there's a lot of different ways to do this. Uh, if you were really bullish with the creative that you have, you could test four different sets of audiences, okay? Or what I do is I find, especially on Facebook, I'm pretty certain what audiences are gonna work, okay? So like for, for SDA, you know, you got the Frank Kern, you got the Ryan Dice, the Mike Diller, Digital Marketer, you got uh, Tony Robbins, you got Grant Cardone, like you guys probably target the same audiences. Like it's not rocket science, they haven't, they haven't freaking changed the targeting in like five years. So it's like, I call it the usual suspects audience. That's literally what it's called in our thing. It's like the usual suspects, because we target the same thing every single time. The audience is about 10 million. So there's not, a, I don't really need to do a lot of split testing that way, because I know where they are, you know? like. I know where they are, it's cool. So what I do instead is I have those four campaigns, all the audiences are the same, and then what I'll do is I'll make the variant the creative, okay? And what I'll do is I'll make one, like I'll try to target one pain point, pain point one and campaign one, pain point two and campaign two, pain point three and campaign three, and pain point four and campaign four. 
Does that make sense? And also, like maybe you want to split test a VSL. So then I would have one, two, like campaign one, campaign two, campaign three, campaign four, and one and two would go to VSL A, three and four would go to VSL B. So like I would think about it that way, and you kind of just got to go through a series of testing to, okay, this creative works, all right, maybe I got to do a few more variants on this creative. And then also like you could try new audiences. You know, you could. I find with Facebook especially, if you just go broad and then your copy's very specific, it just narrows in very well. You know, you can't like, I mean, sometimes you can just go wide open, right? We've done that for RCA, just wide open, no targeting at all. I know Billie Jean, no targeting. Like he just goes wide open, US Canada. And then on his international stuff, he just goes, you know, Australia, New Zealand, UK, whatever. Like no targeting at all, but he's super broad, super broad. So if you're a little bit more narrow, I would err on the side of going broad, knowing your messaging is going to zero in on the pocket. And also, the creative is the most important part. That's why all my variation is based on the creative. That, it's always going to be the most important. That and the funnel. Does it make sense? Cool. All right. And then also, OK, so how do you know the test is working? What we look for is on, so I'm going to look for initial cost per lead, but most importantly, cost per book call. So I want to look for cost per book call to really get uh, enough, like a, and I don't know if this is going to be technically statistical significance, but it's going to be enough, right? I want to look for three to five times my target cost per book call. So if my target cost per book call is 300 bucks, I want to be spending 900 to 1500 before I make a decision on if that angle is going to work. And then on the sales cycle side, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Oh, on the duration side, I definitely want to, I want to spend, like I want it to run at least three days, right? Because like, so, you could spend three times CPA on the very first day, but I wouldn't kill the test on day one, you know? So that's why you kind of want to also like vary your budget a little bit. So pretty much on day three, you're somewhere in a three to five X multiple of, of, the, uh, of the test budget-wise. Does it make sense? Cool. Makes sense to everybody else. Anybody other questions on that? So do we don't even really look at, like, so, like, initially, you know, I'm going to ballpark it off our other previous tests, but really what we look at is CPA. Like, we used the bidding strategy he talked about uh, yesterday, and we did 5x manual bid on cost per lead for our SDA campaigns. Our cost per MQL, which is a marketing qualified lead that's an approved application, it went up by about $200, but it brought our CPA down by, like, $1,000. Yeah, so like our CPA went way down. And so we were getting less calls, but they were higher quality, and our sales team was like, these are really good. So at the, at the end of the day, I always look at CPA. Like, it's like you look at CPA first, and also the return on ad spend from the CPA, right? CPA, return on ad spend first. If that has any sort of errors in there, I'm going to look at uh, cost per book call, and then I'm going to back out look at cost per lead. Right? And then also you can look at all the metrics down the funnel and see kind of like where are you off. Is it the VSL conversion? Is it your ad CTR? Like you can kind of pick up some clues on where the funnel is having a breakdown. Are you tracking CPA across all channels? Yeah. So if you want to, I think, because somebody else asked a question about this. Um, Austin, will you pull up my old doc from yesterday? Austin. Here, let's just try it. Maybe I can actually find it. Uh, but yeah, I can show you. It's, it's, it's a little bit much, but it is pretty, pretty solid. So there's this. Eight. OK, here we go. So if we go down here. Yeah, I skipped over this because I was like, this is a little bit much to cover yesterday. But um, so, uh, so basically, here's how we do our marketing system. All right? So like you guys probably have one of these. It's a master tracker, right? So every single day, we'll have like each channel down here. We'll have email. We'll have bookings coming from our website. We'll have the totals. 
And basically, it all populates down to here. So like amount spent, and we just got every significant metric. This is included, so don't don't worry about like taking a screenshot or whatever. But we have every significant metric, how many approved apps, how many canceled, cost per approved app. So cost per approved app is one of the biggest things that we looked at, aside from CPA. Right? So we have that all the way down to like every single metric. So we have that. You guys would probably have something similar. But then what we do on a daily basis is like our version, you know, sales team, how you run projections. Our version of that is this for marketing. So this sheet is our budgets projections. We look at this every single day. This is always how many days there is in the month. Okay? And this is how many days as of yesterday. So in this sheet, it would be like August 26 or July 26, right? This tab would be the month. So this would say July. This would say 25. That would mean it's July 26. You're always reporting on yesterday's data. Does that make sense? Cool. And so you can see each color here is the channel, right? So like this is, I think this was for SDA. So like we run on Facebook and then we run a different funnel on Facebook. So we have a different ad account that runs a totally different angle like a totally different funnel altogether. So we track that almost like a different channel. Then we have TikTok, which we don't run anymore, but we, we were testing. So we were running TikTok. And then we have ad rolls. So ad rolls like GDN and a few other networks. It's like a display, G, you know, GDN. We have our email. We have our SMS. And then we have, here's our setters. So we have our setters, and we mark all of their metrics down the funnel. We look at that every single day. We have cold email, so we're doing like 253 hundred grand a month through cold email. We have our cold calling, so this is not our setters, this is like calling people we scrape LinkedIn data off of, right? And then, whoa. Then this is our totals for all of the paid, so everything minus our cold end-to-end -end outbound division, and this is the totals for the entire division. So we look at everything from spend, and then we also wanna look, like, look at our, our media buyer, make sure we're always on spend, pace. Like we have to be on pace for spend. Okay, daily budget, we look at leads. So we have a leads projection each month and the marketing team has to be on pace for that leads projection. Does it make sense? So CPL, right? We have like a CPL projection every single month. Lead to close, we have a lead to close, like out of the leads we generated, closes divided by leads generated. So we have a projection for that, projection for how many applications generated by marketing, the cost of those applications, booking, cost per MQL and MQL, total qual qualified opportunity is MQLs plus setters plus cold outbound uh, end to end, okay? So that's all of those together. And essentially, we have a KPI for the marketing team to hit that as well. We always wanna look at if we're pacing that, right? The same way your sales rep is like, are we on pace for our projections? This, you know, If the sales rep projected 30, you wanna see, are you on pace for those projections? Does that make sense? The marketing team needs to be on pace for MQL and total qualified opportunity, okay? Then we look at booking to close, close one total, and CPA, right? And then so we divide this out by channel, and then we add it up at the end. And so we look at every, we have projections for every single channel, set, uh, we set the, the projections 10 days before the month. 10 days before the month, we set all the projections on the marketing team for the next month, and then we make sure we hit those projections for every single channel and the division as a whole. And then so when the division as a whole is off pace, we can reverse engineer back to the channel and where the breakdown is specifically. Right? It could be the sales team, it could be the marketing team, but we look at this every day. This is, so like sales team, you do projections every day, right? I'm like really big on you guys doing that. With the marketing team, we do this every single day. Does it make sense? I know that's, and this is like probably a lot, but this is like, we, we slowly built this over the course of, you know, the last 18 months. And so it is, I'm sure there's probably a simpler way to do this, but, you know, it, it gives us a lot of clarity. And in terms of our decision making, in terms of marketing, it's tremendously better. So do you manually have somebody put the data on? Yeah, so, so, the, so it goes into this sheet first, right? It goes into this sheet first and then people populate this every day before the marketing meeting. So everybody who's responsible for certain metrics, they have to populate it in this sheet before the uh, marketing meeting. So, have you tried it kind of like dude, there's a software we're looking at to do that right now, yeah. But I'm, I'm a big like, I, I hate when you automate stuff and then it like doesn't work. Right. You know, it's like, oh great, we're automating and it doesn't work. You know, it's like, how hard is it to just have like somebody who does data entry just enter it, you know? But um, I'll show you how we did that too, is like if you look at this very first page, it's pretty old, but I, I, I basically color-coded 
I, I listed out all the metrics we needed to do, and I color coded who was responsible for the metrics every single day. And they report on yesterday's data today by 9 a.m., which is the marketing meeting. That way it's always in sync every single time, and then we review it every single day. Do you go further into depth in this video? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I was like, man, if I sit up here and talk about this, people are going to be like, eyes are glazing over. It's like a little bit, a little bit much. Yeah, I, I, it's in the course. Okay. It's, it's under eight figure operations. I do the same thing with the finance sheets. Do you go over how to set the projections for the marketing and can they support that? Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. We kind of, what we do is we just look at the last five months and last month and we kind of see like, what we, we just kind of try to get a good ballpark. We're trying to be accurate. The other thing is too, if you're on a push month, you know that you're gonna have to allocate, like if our MQL last month was 500 bucks, right? But we're on a push month and we're gonna increase units by 20%, I'm probably gonna budget based off a $600 MQL. So I'm gonna add a little bit of padding in there, right? But if we're on a sustaining month, let's say last month we did 100 units, this month we're doing 100 units, then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna see if we can get our $500 MQL down to 475. Right, I'm going to try to make the system more efficient because we're sustaining on a top line level. Right? It's like the bodybuilder, you know, you bulk and then you, you sustain, right? Or you, or you bulk, you cut, you bulk, you cut. Kind of like that in a sense. So we kind of just ballpark it, but it's important to reverse engineer and back all these numbers out and then make sure like the marketing team is responsible for a certain amount of metrics. Right? The sales team is responsible for a certain amount of efficiency based on those metrics. Lead to close, right? set to close. Uh, all that stuff. Anybody else have anything else? You? How do you think about when, you know, push versus sustaining? Is it something where you're really thinking on a quarter by quarter basis? Or they just kind of. I found like, you know, you have you have one of your best months and, you know, and you can really challenge a sales team's belief by, uh, you know, pushing it too hard. Like it just depends. Like, a, I'd say the biggest thing is how many ramped sales people do we have? Because like, if you only, like, you could want to increase, but if you have like, let's say five salespeople, they're all hitting like 30 units a month, which 30 units a month requires them to close 30% plus on calls, you know, you're, you need to ramp more salespeople to push the projection, right? So a lot of it is just depending on how many ramped salespeople do we have. And then so in the quarterly offsites that we have with all the executives, one of the things I want the executives to look at is essentially how many, uh, like, the projecting out next month, month after, month after that, month after that, and how many ramped salespeople, like how many salespeople do we need that are hired, how many are ramping, and how many are within KPI, right? When we look at that and we have that basis, we can kind of see like, this is what we should be able to project based on that. Cause like kind of, you know, we kind of think of like a ramp salesperson should be able to do, let's say like 25 units or 30 units. So if we have X amount of ramp salespeople, we can see what our projection should be and then we kind of back everything out from that. We back out spend, we back out everything from that. Is that 30% target live call to close or separate? Live call to close, right? So, and I don't know if that's our actual tar, I mean, it's, yeah, it's up there, right? You mentioned you're running two ad accounts. Do you do that for any other reason other than in case we get shut down? Well, what happened was, so we, we created this new angle for, for SDA. Right, to get into, uh, it was just kind of like a different angle. And I kept it in the same ad account, and then when we launched it, it threw everything out of KPI, and we had to just like restart everything and make new creatives. It was like super frustrating. Everything was working, we just launched new campaigns, threw everything out of KPI, right? Lost a bunch of money. So the next, well, once I got it back up and working, I was like, okay, I wanna test this thing again, but we're gonna test it in a different ad account with a different pixel, because I was afraid that it was again, for some reason, and I think it is because the cost per lead is so high, and there's, all, there's not very many pixel fires per week per ad set, and the TAM is very small. With our SDA campaigns, if we just even like touch it, the, touch the budget, it'll throw it all out of KPI. It's so frustrating. But RCA is a little bit more resilient, and I just think that's because there's so much data coming through. You know? Cool. Um, anybody else have a question on the marketing stuff? Just a so you're $200 a week for VSL. Yeah. Yeah, but then the, the VSL converts to like 50 to 70%. Right, but that's that's a direct funnel is going to do that, right? So like you just gotta realize like if you're running let's say an indirect lead, which let's say it's a secret lead that's curiosity based, I can get leads for ten bucks, 
but the conversion rate is not going to be as good. If I run one that's like, here's the offer, it's going to repel a lot of people. My CTR might be 0.6. My, my cost per lead might be 200 bucks. But then my conversion on the VSL is 75%. I'm paying 250 bucks a call. And they're intent based. Like, see what I mean? Like, and all the opt ins the setters call are intent based. So you just got to play around. Like, indirect's not necessarily better than direct. Right now, RCA is actually on an indirect funnel, and SDA is on a direct one. We tested RCA on a direct one, and it just it worked actually really well, but the, the people were really hard to close. So we, we switched it back. And then US setters were in the SDA Yeah. Works well. Yeah. Uh, typically, no. It's going to be the same. Yeah, like, think about it this way. You could test uh, angle one is a story that leads into the same landing page, same VSL, same everything. Angle two could be a secret, like curiosity loop. Angle three could be direct, and angle four could be like a promise lead. Like if you read Great Leads, he talks about, I think it's either the six or seven different types of lead types. You know, there's offer lead, promise lead, secret lead, story lead, proclamation lead, a couple others, I forget what they are. And uh, yeah, I, I usually think of like, okay, let's test a few stories, let's test a few promises, let's test like a direct one, let's test, uh, I love secret leads, especially for indirect B2C, because people will watch the VSL like to figure out the secret. You know? They want like like Chris said, they want to see if they're right. So that's like the cause cause what you also want is to pull people in. So if you can open this big loop in the ad, then they have to opt in and watch the video to close the loop. And then before you close that loop, you open up another loop. That's kinda like what you want to do with those. Indirect. Cool. Uh, so Brendan, Brendan Burns, you asked CSM question. How often do you recommend meeting with your CSM team per week? And how should that frequency change based on how many clients you have and how many CSMs you have? Well, the frequency is, do you have anything you want to add to that, by the way? No, I just feel like we're meeting twice a week now. And like, I feel like we could be doing more. Even though it's kind of yeah, well, you know what I'm going to say, right? Daily. Yeah, okay. you should meet daily. Um, if you want to know the cadence of that meeting, the last event, we went over the CSM team. It's also in the course. It's called How to Build an Eight-Figure CSM Team. And then I think it says Dash New. That one will basically teach the meeting cadence, what we do, all of that stuff. I mean, it's like the end-all, be-all CSM training. So, so we got Sophie again. Working with women who are balancing with families, I want to ensure how I run my business is leading by example of what's possible for them. What would you say has been your best move to leverage your time and stress as a business owner? Do you have anything you want to add to that? Huh. Well, I don't know. I mean, for me, I, I, I work a lot. And like the thing is, our values really stem from a lot of like my character traits and who I am. Um, I think somebody famous or something said, like, your values should be built in the founder's shadow or something like that. I'm probably butchering the quote. But yeah, I mean, like, for us, I was thinking about this this morning, actually. We have very much a team who everybody in our, on our team is in a phase of their life where they want to work really fucking hard, right? And they want to grow really fucking, like, they want to grow as much as fucking possible, right? So we, we, we attract people in that phase. And we recently had somebody who had the uh, competency for a certain role we were recruiting for, but they dropped out of the recruiting process and sent a message to me, and they said, I, you know, I love what you're doing, I think the mission is great, I think the va I'm just not in a phase of my life where I wanna work hard. And I'm like, thanks for letting us know, you know, perfect. Right, so now, I have another client, she's not here, but she does like probably five to seven million a year, and uh, she is like in a totally different phase. You know, she's, she's been with us for a while. She's actually one of Igor's clients. And uh, she was telling us that, like, she's in a phase where she just wants to coast and, like, wants to, like, chill, um, you know, and, and basically her values is, like, she doesn't allow her employees to work weekends. She makes them take off a certain, you know, three-day weekend a month or something. Like, there's certain values that are really important to her 
and she attracts people on her team who are also like resonate with those values, right? So I think the biggest thing is like you should just really think about what that is for you and just attract people who resonate with those values. You know what I mean? So, and, and honestly, um, that person's really, really successful as well. Very different culture from ours, but they're also very, very successful and very profitable and have a killer business and it serves them with the lifestyle that they want to have. So I think you should just get, get clear on like what you want and what are the, like, you remember the, the, boat, the boat example, right? It's like, where are you going? Why are you going? What you're going? And like, what do you want? How do you want your team to interact with each other on the journey of where you're going? Get clear on all those things based on what's important to you and then attract people who resonate with that. Because also, the last thing you want to do is build a company that you show up to and then one day you're like, I don't like any of these people and I don't like what they stand for. You know, that's the biggest thing that uh, gets founders led to burnout is when they no longer like the people that they're working with. So just keep keep that in mind. Can I just ask sure. So we don't, like, we have a really great culture. So to me, like I work four days a week, five hours a day, have Thursdays off, don't have weekends. And so we have a really great culture. And um, but yet, we've grown. So when I learned from mentors like you, Right. However, here's the challenge that I'm finding. We then have a sales team that was trying to drive hard to get results and hit numbers and KPIs and stuff. But that's actually quite a different strategy to how we do everything else in our company. So they're attracted to us because we're very much around, you know, helpful sales and you know, creating wealth for women and, and you know, balance and time freedom. Right. However, with our sales team, we're like, <laughs> why are you here? This is a great question. Yeah. So, so with the same person who I was giving the example of, we had like four months ago, she asked the same exact question. And honestly, like what they do is they, I mean, they have the belief that you can perform at a really, really high level only working four days a week. Like we can, you know, we can still crush it and still hit really great numbers and really great levels of performance without having to work past 4.30 p.m., without having to work every single Friday of the month, without having to work any weekends at all, they still have that belief, right? So for them, I think it's, it, it, again, like I don't think it's uh, either or, like I'm gonna have this grind, crazy, like hard ass sales team that's super high pressure, or my sales team's not gonna be good. I don't think it's an either or, I think you can have an and. Does that make sense? Like I think you can have a sales team that really likes working with you because there's more flexibility than other sales positions out there, but then on the flip side, still performs at a really high level. You know what I mean? There, there's a lot of people who are extremely competent, but are in a season of their life where, you know, maybe they just had a kid, or, you know, I, I don't know, like they're, they're prioritizing, you know, some things over work a little bit, but they're still highly competent. And in the hours that they do work, they can still do a really good job. So you would want to attract those people. First of the people I attract are in the season where they're like, they're like, yeah, like I, you know, I'll work 12 hours, I don't care, you know? And then the how on that, how do you attract them? How do you train someone to be able to hit those numbers in less time so they can have Friday off? Well, I, I, you know, so, so the question is, how would you train them? Well, I, I think you got to first look at what's realistic, right? So, like, if they're if they're not going to work any weekends at all, like for us, our people work like two six-day weeks. They take one, so it's like out of our sales team, if there's four Saturdays, they'll work two, right? So we know based on whatever that is, maybe 22 days or, or what have you, kind of like what their projection should be. So for you, maybe you lower the expectation a little bit of what that can actually be, first of all. So I think it, the, the first thing is making a realistic expectation. And then the second thing is if their expectation is realistic and they're still not hitting their numbers, you need to figure out what are they not doing to be able to hit their numbers. There can only be two things. It's either insufficient volume or insufficient uh, efficiency, right? So they're literally not making enough offers or not doing enough calls or their closing rate is too low. Does it make sense? So it's as simple as that. So you just kind of first figure out what's accurate, what's realistic for the person. And then number two, if they're still not hitting it, is it a lack of activity or is it a lack of skill, essentially, efficiency? Does it make sense? Yeah, so you just got to back that out. And then, you know, for your, like my team, typically, like we want to see 25 to 35 units per week for a closer, right? Maybe your team is, uh, is, is 20, or not per week, per month. Maybe yours is 20 units per month per closer. 
Okay, so I would just figure out what's realistic. So let's get these last couple questions in here. Um, Brian Fisher, where were you? All right, so what are the top things to focus on for a sales team that has inconsistent sales numbers, some months up, some months down? What are the points of leverage and management for maintaining consistent performance month in, month out? Cool, you have anything to add to that? Uh, Mitchell or Brian, do you want to answer that one? Throw him the mic. Get in the mic. Uh, I think that inconsistency will come from one of two places. Uh, one is most likely, it's the least likely, which is you're changing your marketing around. That's uh, probably least likely. Uh, the second thing is almost always going to be life variable changes, right? So uh, it's almost always going to be that they're doing different things outside of sales. It's very rarely has to do with like how they're actually doing the sales call. It's way more about the uh, inputs that they have going on outside of life. So this is why like Cole and I always talk so much about having a good relationship with your salespeople and like why you need to meet often and why you need to be on the phone often and why you need to talk often. Uh, quick example, we had a closer that um, ended a relationship and his closing rate like tanked, but he didn't, he didn't tell me. He was like being super guarded about it. He's a little bit newer on the team. And so like 10 days in, I was listening to his calls and I could tell that it was very clear that it, it was not like, oh, he's just like not doing sales right. It's like, okay, this guy's like not here. He's not in the right headspace. So I got on Zoom and I was like, dude, what's the deal? And he's like, oh, I'm just, I'm having a hard time. And I was like, what's the deal? And he's like, oh, I'm having a hard time. And I was like, dude, I'm gonna fire you if you don't tell me what the deal is, like what's going on? And he was like, oh, I got dumped. And I was like, yeah, no shit, you can't sell. And, uh, and so we made him take time off and like work with a coach and handle his shit. And now he's like back and first day back went like three for three on live calls. So I would say 90% of the time it's going to be things outside of the actual sales call that's then coming into their sales calls. Yep. It, that's what I would say. L let, me, let me also put it another way. So have you guys ever, you know, for your health, your fitness or whatever, you, you, you fall off the wagon and you feel really bad about yourself and then you get back on the wagon and you're like five, six, seven days in, maybe two weeks in and you feel like all this momentum, like you're the freaking man, right? So that little like, that little phase, you want your closers to always be in that phase where they're, they're follow, like they feel like they're winning in their life. They're making commitments to themselves and others, following through on those commitments, right? It's like the same way as when you start that new workout routine and you start waking up at like 5 a.m. every day and then you start re feel it, feeling really good about waking up at 5 a.m. every day because you're keeping that commitment to yourself and you're doing something that's hard. That headspace is where you want them to be, right? Now what happens is they're not in that headspace and then they're not closing and then you yell at them, they get in that headspace and then they, they, they start like, oh, okay, you know, I'm gonna follow through, I'm gonna be consistent, I'm gonna start doing all of these things I know I need to do outside of the calls so I can show up the way I need to on the calls and then their closes start to go up and then what happens? They, they forget what got them there in the first place. They forget that on the journey of getting to their personal best, they were making an extra 100 outbound dials a day. They were waking up at 5 a.m. every day. They were reading a book as soon as they wake up. They were doing you know, their breath work or meditation or workout or whatever the hell it is, right? They forget all those things. So the leading indicators that got them to where they are at their personal best, they start to think like, oh, I'm just so good that I can like, not, yeah, I can just show up and not do those things. And then so they, they, they stop doing those things, and guess what? They keep winning for a little bit because there's still that lag of them doing all the right things. And then what happens is they start to go back down. And then you have to remind them, like, oh, okay, you know, well, yeah, you didn't close. You woke up 30 minutes before the sales meeting. 
right? So it's like, it's, it's a little basic stuff like that, but um, I would say like that is, I mean, you know, when I was a sales rep, like I, I learned, I know this well, because I learned this the hard way. Like I, I, I went through that. But that's the biggest thing is they just need to keep like, because if they feel good every day, they, and they're consistently feeling on like in pocket, and like they're winning and they, like, they have momentum, they're gonna close well. Uh, one more question about sales team, Vaughn. Can I, can I add to the well, projection? Well, there's another, yes, there's another sales team question, I'll so I was quick. gonna let you guys answer this one too. Okay, can I add to the sure. projection thing? Yeah, so I think something that's often slept on as well is finding the actual like problem on the call. So it's, it's either like an out, it's like a life circumstance like they're not focusing on the leading indicators, maybe, again, they're going through a breakup, something like that. But something that's often slept on, it's really boring, is, is actually like finding the point on the call, because sometimes it is a process thing. Sometimes people, they just close or just forget the fundamentals. So something I notice when I'm like on group calls or on one-on-ones with, with you guys is just the lack of diligence on reviewing like a batch of calls. So I know this from experience, I just did this. Like one of my closers was just like missing left and right. Used to be really good. I'm like, what's going on in your life? He's like a good dude. Nothing, nothing really changed. I'm like, well, like I, I wanted to avoid it and procrastinate it, but I just got like 10 to 12 calls, went to a coffee shop and like just binged them. And there's like not, it's like there's a difference between doing like a professional call review, like on a meeting, like let's review this, give you feedback, and then just batching 10. I promise you, you'll get into like six calls, like five to six calls, and it's, there's a pattern. You're like, I know why you're missing it. And it's way, way easier to coach a sales rep when you can actually tell them, here's what you're missing, and here's how to fix it. And then they're just like, oh yeah, you know? And I tell them sometimes, go back to the training, watch the cost. Like you're just not digging into cost enough. Go through the cost training, let's talk. They go to the cost training, they're like, they just start late, like just crushing sales. So it's either life circumstance, it's like a process problem on the call, or they just like forgot the fundamentals, like waking up and taking care of themselves, like yeah. a big boy. Right, a, a different way to say what, what Mitchell said and why that happens is you guys know who Neil Rackman is? He wrote Spin Selling. He's like one of the most prominent researchers in sales and really in business. So he's kind of like the Jim Collins for like sales. Okay, so we wrote Spin Selling, and I don't know if it was in Spin Selling, I think this might have actually been in the Challenger sale, which is a, is a decent book. But what they were saying is there's this phenomena where they'd have these sales reps, and after nine months, they would like start to not perform anymore. And like, I mean, they, were, they had like tons of data. So these were like big organizations. And so they had tons of data and they were doing this research and they noticed the sales reps at the nine month mark start to have a gradual decline in performance. And so after all of the research of looking into this, what they figured out was that these sales reps had taken so many calls with the same prospects, the same problem in the same market needing the same solution, that what they're like, what basically happened is like your brain is always trying to conserve energy. So opposed to being present and engaged and curious and asking great questions on the call and having that like beginner's day one mindset, their brain was conserving energy and creating like a pathway to like basically conserve their energy, right? Like that's what our brains always want to do is conserve energy, not die. So they were conserving energy and they started going through the motions and, and, and they assumed like the big thing they found is they assumed what their prospects problems were. And even if they were right, they never truly elicited it on the call. Right, you guys have probably had this where you had so many sales calls with the same prospect, type of prospect, same market, same problem, they need the same solution. And after you've had like a couple hundred of these, like the person comes, shows up, and within five minutes, you're like, okay, I know exactly what this person's problems are. I know what they need to do to fix their business. And you're like, okay, I know this, I know this. And like, you just kind of want to get through it. You're like, okay, let's just like get through this thing. Because like, you literally have had this conversation over so many freaking hundreds of times. Like, you know this person better than they know themselves. So what happens is at that nine month mark, Neil found that that's what was happening to the sales reps. And so instead of asking great questions, and instead of like, even though they knew what the problem was, still coming in with that beginner's mindset and asking the questions to elicit it anyways, they were just making assumptions, weren't going deep enough with the prospects, and going too quickly to the pitch. And what they found is once they did an intervention with the sales team and they had them go back to re-eliciting the problem every single time, all the performance went back up. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that study is pretty cool. Yeah, I read that, I read that a couple years ago. Uh, okay. Sorry? No, you don't change up the questions. You remind them to keep asking the questions they were asking when they first came on. Right? You see what I mean? It's like they're just they're, they they. It's like you you go on and you know what the prospect's problem is because you had the conversation so many times. So instead of going deep like you were in the beginning when you were curious, you're like, oh, I already get it. Yeah. 
so you skip over and you forget that the questions are for the prospect, not for you. Does it make sense? Yeah. Cool. Uh, okay, Vaughn, you were asking, how do I make my closers comfortable with challenging prospects after they've gotten objections? They're either... Either they play too soft and quick, or they ram too hard and it leaves a bad taste in the, in the prospect. Right. So, Brian or Mitchell, you want to answer that one? I was talking to Sasha. I didn't hear the question. What was the question? The question was, how do I make my clo basically, how do you make your closers comfortable with challenging prospects at the end of the call, and then kind of as like a is a thing to tack on to that. How do you balance the dichotomy of like the closers pendulum swinging and like pushing way too freaking hard to where it's like basically uncompliant and the, and the person gets pissed off versus like just being a yes man and being like, oh, okay, yeah, let's follow up next Tuesday. Mm. Um, I, that's, a, that's a big question. Uh, I think so the first part, I think a principle that I always like really, really, really focus on with our closers is that every single person that you talk to is closable. And if they don't close, you need to own that it's like your fault as a closer that they didn't close. And then I couple that with, if you ever like close somebody that shouldn't be in our program, it's okay. Like I'll make sure it's taken care of and I'll, I'll handle it. I'll refund them. So like, I don't want you in like this God superior or the complex where you're like, oh, this person's a perfect fit and this person's not. Like I want my closers making offers to every single person they talk to within like a margin of reason, right? But let's try and close every single person we can. Let's try and help every single person we can. And if they don't close, it's your fault. Because there's a way I promise like they could have closed. One thing I'll always say to them is like if you took that person and sat them across from Tony Robbins for 20 minutes, like would Tony Robbins close that person? Yes, 100%. So it's obviously possible. So I think that's the first part. It's like I, I want them believing that they can close every single person that they talk to. Uh, the second part about pendulum swinging, man, that's a lot. I think there's a couple things there. I think number one, that's like what Mitchell was saying about like batching call reviews. I think as a sales manager, that's really a process of just constantly calibrating while they're figuring out their own calibration themselves, just constantly helping them realize. Uh, and then really like, just going through Cole's objection handling and making sure that they actually know how to like get to the root cause of the problem and like call out the bullshit rather than like dealing in surface level conversations. So what I see as a huge problem is closers will like not handle the call correctly. They get to the end of the call and then they realize like I didn't do a good enough discovery, my pitch kind of sucked. And then this is where they'll pendulum swing to either just like being like, okay, I got punched in the face on this call, I can't close them, I, my discovery sucked, and they just give up. Or they like get to the end and they're like, oh, well, you're just gonna make $10,000 next month, so like give me money, and they like say something really stupid. And so it's just that process of constantly calibrating them to do all the right little things throughout the call so that they don't get to the end and feel flustered and do something stupid. So I, I don't know if that was like a perfect answer, but there's like a, a lot of context that would be needed there. Yeah, I, I'm a non ROI offer. So usually what ends up happening is every objection gets handled. No uncertainty, no all that bullshit just ends up coming down like, like well, there's some that's gonna be financial fears, right? Mm. So getting them to kind of finesse and stay in the pocket about not wrangling the finances, but yeah, so I'll go over that right now. So basically, what, what you do at the end, this is how I teach it uh, all the time, is it's like, so you drop the price, and then they say whatever they're going to say. And let's say they say, oh, yeah, dude, really want to do it, it's just the money. I say, no problem. So money and everything aside, is there anything less that's keeping, anything that's keeping you from being less than 100% certain that this is really what you want to do now, and or this is the right thing, and now is the right time? And then they say, Oh, no, I really want to do it. Gotcha. So like finances and everything aside, you're 100% in. And then they say, yes. Right? You got to get the yes. If you have any ambiguity at all, you got to say, oh, you, don't, you don't sound like you're 100% in. So what's, what's really going on? Right? We need that yes. Right? We need like that good. And, and sometimes you'll call them out. I'll err on the side of calling them out. They'll be like, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm totally in. It's just, it's just the money. I'm like a little scared. Gotcha. Well, look, most of Ann's clients, they just pay the entire thing up front. But for certain clients, depending on their financial situation. So we do that. Okay. We do all that. And if they get freaked out when it comes down to spouse, like the, the ones that really slip through is the spouses and all that other kind of thing. 
and then they err, like you put it down, I want them to be a little more aggressive in terms of getting the clothes. Because as soon as they go through that whole style thing, or when you follow up with you, less than 10%, those calls follow up with even that happens. Mm -hmm. So it's a mixture of how much emotionality you can give the project and discovery. I drill that and they put their heads every day. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? It's just, it gets, you know, either need more of that, more call reviews. Even Dave Pigs, he looks at myself. He's a young boy, he's doing everything right with him. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So. Well, if it's the spouse, so is, is the objection the finances or the spouse? Spouse's permission about the man's Right. So, 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 so it, it depends, right? You want to figure out if this is a situation where they have to just like, they've already decided and they just got to let that person know, or if they need their permission, they right? Have. It's always permission, but I'm like, they <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. Right. So, so, uh, so, so, yeah, like, you, you, you get the real, you get the tie down. You're like, gotcha. So money and everything aside, you really want to do this, right? They're like, right, gotcha. So like, let's just suppose for a moment that you had already talked to your spouse and they said, look, Vaughn, like, if you really want to do this and, and you think this is the best thing, you do whatever's best for our family. If, if you'd already had that conversation and we were talking again right now, what do you think would be the next step from there, right? But anything else than, oh, I'd be getting started is obviously an uncertainty-based objection. Yeah. So they say, oh, no, I'd be getting started. Gotcha. So you'd be basically 100% giving you your credit card. We'd be getting started. Cool. So what do you think your spouse is going to think? Let's talk about that. And then you go through a little, now you're going to do a mini discovery. OK, what do you think she's going to, what, what do you think she's going to say? You know, you mentioned to me your biggest problem or the biggest thing that you're focused on right now is blank. Do you think she's supportive of you fixing that? Right? You see how I asked? Do you think she's supportive of fixing the problem, not you doing the program? Correct. Okay, so I asked about that. Then I'll say, what do you think she's gonna say when she hears the price? Because a lot of them are like, oh yeah, she's super supportive. Okay, what do you think she's gonna say when she hears the price? She's gonna say it's a lot. Well, how do you plan on handling that conversation? They're like, oh, can I give you a little bit of, co can, can, can I give you a little bit of coaching on that? Because there's two ways you can go about it. You can either say, you know, like, hey, honey, I, uh, I found this guy on the internet who's, uh, who, who, who's gonna, who's gonna help us and like, is gonna help me with music and, you know, uh, it is five grand. And we're like, what do you think? Or you could say, look, you know, for the last three years, problem X Y Z has been really important to me, and honestly, I've been showing up in the relationship that I wanted to because there's this big gap that I've left uh, open and I haven't fulfilled myself. So I found somebody who's going to help me with that, who's going to be accountable to that, and I promise you that not only will I follow through with this, but at the same time, I'll show up for better with you in terms of doing so, right? So right now, I'm not asking for your permission. I'm going to do this. I just want your support. Right. Now watch this <laughs> so, so then you, but, but hold on. You give those two things, and then you say, so which one of those two do you think is going to be better? And which one of those two do you think you're going to do? Now you promise me you will show up that way. Right? So you, you really got to like get them into this. Because they, you know, on the call, they don't really think about like, oh, I'm going to get steamrolled. You know? So they got to show up and be like prepared and bring a little bit of the certainty. Now, ideally though, what you can do is you can go through all of that and then you can pivot back and get a refundable deposit. And then that way, they at least won't ghost you. They got to show up. And then you can just say, hey, like, look, this shows me you're committed and you're going to have the conversation to that level. And then look, you know, if, if she's so upset that where she throws your, your clothes out in the lawn and tells you to get out of the house and kicks you out and you're going to get a divorce, look, just show up Tuesday. We'll refund you. And I'll give you some homework and some next steps to work on anyways. Yeah, a lot of it's the certainty, though. Like, if they're, if they're super sold, like, if you have somebody who's manically freaking sold into this thing, like, they will figure it out, dude. They will have the conversation that they need. You know what I mean? So a lot of it is like, what do I say at the end? But at the same time, I'm like, how, like let's, let's sell them better on the front end in the first place. Because if, like, people are, like, if they have their mind set on something that they have to do it to get to desired state, like, they will figure out a way, and a lot of the objections become irrelevant. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. I think we've got to wrap it up. Can I add one small, small add-on to that that's worked really well for RCA? It's a little bit cheeky, but it works super, super well. So when you get to the deposit part, this is how I handle it in addition to what Cole did. So after everything that Cole did, I'll say, hey, look, here's what I think you need to do. 
How many times so far in your journey have you told your spouse that you were going to do something and then you didn't actually do it? A lot. How many times on Sunday have you told your spouse that you were going to start the diet on Monday and you quit the diet by Friday? A lot. So here's what we're going to do. You're going to put $1,000 down as a soft, refundable deposit so that you can go to your spouse and say, hey, I made a soft commitment, but I value you, and I didn't want to make the full commitment without you being able to be involved in the decision. So I asked them if I could put $1,000 down and get access to the training and have an onboarding call so that you could be on the onboarding call and be a part of the decision with me. That was good. Drop the mic. That was good. That was, be that was better than mine. That was daddy. All right, guys.